Okay, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today we're having an assembly, this is an official assembly budget subcommittee, subcommittee number two on education finance, on uh, higher education in California, specifically looking at uh, a campus uh, specific uh, case study here at UC Santa Barbara. This is being televised through our um, assembly web portal on the Cal channel, so people may be watching across uh, California. So it's great to be here today in uh, sunny Santa Barbara. It's uh, raining and cold up in uh, Sacramento. I, I know we appreciate rain. I think it's going to rain here in a couple days. So I've had a busy morning here at, um, at uh, Santa Barbara so far. I want to thank Chancellor Yang for um, uh, walking me around campus. I will note, Chancellor Yang, that I'm pulling up my phone here, and today with you, I've already walked uh, 13,000 steps, <laughs> 6.8 miles, <laughs> and 20 floors. So we saw a lot of the uh, UC Santa Barbara campus here. So it's a, um, it's a beautiful campus, and we already uh, learned a lot, and at this hearing, we're going to get a bit more uh, focusing on higher in general, but specifically looking at uh, the UC and UC Santa Barbara. And of course, I'm excited here to be joined by my assembly member, uh, Monique Limon, who represents, uh, of course, Santa Barbara in the State Assembly, uh, also uh, serves with me on the Budget Subcommittee overseeing uh, education funding and higher ed and UC funding, and of course is co-hosting this uh, hearing with me today. And I think we're going to be joined a little bit by, um, by, uh, by Senator Jackson. And so, again, I wanted to thank the, uh, the faculty and students for attending this hearing and for welcoming us. Um, you know, it's important for us to, uh, to get out throughout California to see from the campus perspective what's going on. And so, um, of course, we have 10 University of California campuses, uh, 23 or so CSUs, and about 100 community college campuses. So it's important for us to get out of the Capitol grounds and those boring committee rooms to see things firsthand, to talk to students and faculty, to see um, some research professionals and see things um, firsthand. And you know, the UC and the state of California are, are of course, a, a partnership in supporting the UC operations. It, it hasn't been easy since the Great Recession hit, uh, as you know, but um, uh, we have been a, a bit uh, on the rebound, as you know, in the last uh, few years. We've uh, increased funding by about a billion dollars since 2012, 2013. Welcome, Senator Jackson. And um, we, of course, have greatly increased uh, financial aid money as well through our Cal Grant program. We're really excited about serving more California students. You know, when, when uh, I know we talk nitty gritty about UC and ratios and buildings and faculty, but when I go to my Trader Joe's or the soccer field, or when Assembly Member Limon talks to people as well, they all want to talk about their kids, their neighbors, and getting access to the world-class university of California system. So uh, certainly we've been pleased that we've increased uh, enrollment by 15,000 slots for California students in the last uh, five years. I know UC Santa Barbara has had a piece of that, uh, seeing the steady growth of 21% um, uh, in, in um, increase in state funding in the last uh, five years has seen certainly uh, helped with enrollment growth. But we know it's a, it's a partnership, again, with the, we've had to look at the three issues, state funding, money from, from non-resident students throughout California, which has been an issue, not so much here at Santa Barbara, but others, and of course, student fees. We need to balance all those things and make sure we have resources to fund the world-class UC system. And we also know that higher education more and more in today's uh, you know, global economy is a need. You know, in order to get a good paying job today and tomorrow, we, we need more uh, graduates more people with certificates, and UC is a piece of the puzzle, and not only um, having uh, increased enrollment, but having students graduate within four years. And I know that uh, UC is, is uh, UC Santa Barbara, I was told earlier, it's 3.9 years, the average time for graduation here. That seems like some type of a typo, so we want to, to get to that a bit later, but I'm um, very impressed by that, and we need to focus on that uh, statewide as well. Uh, we know there are cer certainly some needs. Um, saw s some facilities here, the old science buildings, which uh, need a, a rehab. Um, you know, I think that uh, one thing that uh, Budget Chairman and I on the Assembly side, uh, Assembly Member King and I are, are looking forward to pushing forward a capital uh, bond for higher education. I know the past few years we've had that solely on the UC system, but we think in order to, to meet um, enrollment growth and to make sure it's a top-notch 
education system that the UC system having uh, facilities bond and about makes sense. Um, uh, with that, uh, I know we're, we're going to have a great opportunity to get down in the weeds, talk about some issues, and I wanted to uh, invite um, uh, Assembly Member Limon and Senator Jackson to uh, say a few words at the beginning as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I appreciate you being here um, and, and having this meeting here as a member of the committee. I was very excited um, when our chair decided that he wanted to visit UCSB because he had not yet. So this is your first visit, right, yeah. to UCSB, um, a place that uh, is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, and the chair is, uh, can testify how often I talk about my experience working at UCSB, both with students, but also as a staff member here, um, and how that really does become part of the deliberation process. It becomes part of the conversations we have. Um, and I've appreciated um, Assemblymember uh, Mc McCarty's approach, as well as Assemblymember Ting's approach, in including me on some really hard conversations about uh, how we meet the goal uh, that we have for California to continue to support premier institutions, um, but also to find uh, a pathway for our students uh, to be part of that premier institution. I think as Assemblymember McCarty has said, uh, a very common question you get, um, not always in a hearing or in a meeting is, and, and I don't have, I mean, we have the director of admissions here, so I don't need to even tell her um, how often she must get the question is, well, my son or daughter didn't get in, how do they get in to a UC? And that reality um, <coughs> doesn't stay to uh, an admissions office. It really becomes the reality of elected officials as well um, when we're regularly hearing that. Um, but I, I remind folks that the, the reason is, is because this is a really great product that we're offering, right? It's a really great deal. It's a really great experience. It's a really great education. And if it wasn't the case, then we wouldn't have people in the public regularly asking us about a pathway to get to the UC and to earn a degree from the UC. And that's what it comes down to, that we are offering um, something in California uh, that is, you know, people all around the world want to be part of. Uh, so it's exciting uh, to be here, to hear, to get an update um, about where UCSB is at and um, not just in, in terms of numbers, but in terms of also directives and where uh, UCSB sees itself going. Um, I think it's an important conversation. I know uh, having worked for the UC, sometimes uh, certain UCs get uh, a lot more, of, are a lot more part of kind of the talk. Um, than other UCs, and so I remind folks that um, our system is a system, and um, certainly the needs for one UC may not be replicated at other UCs, and the situation is different. Um, I've seen how hard UCSB has tried, um, really been active in not just enrollment, but in the enrollment looking like California. Um, I, I can't even speak enough to the support services that we provide for students on campus, and so that is all um, very, important part of the larger equation uh, for us in the state legislature. So uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you um, to the chair for hosting this uh, hearing here. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Senator Jackson. Yes, thank you. Uh, just briefly, I want to thank you for including me in this um, event. Uh, this, is, this is our university. We do take a very proprietary interest in it. The chancellor is here. The chancellor is, uh, is the word ubiquitous or uh, omnipresent, um, not necessarily omnipotent, but omnipresent, um, and uh, has done a great job, uh, as has the faculty and the student body, in, in making UCSB one of the finest public institutions uh, in the country. And uh, I'm honored to serve on the Senate uh, Budget Sub-1, which is the uh, education subcommittee, so I uh, get a lot of love from the university, usually around budget time, uh, but I give a lot of love. I, I am uh, so honored to, uh, to be the senator representing this area and this university, and not just because my husband has been the voice of the Gaucho women's basketball, uh, the public address announcer for 25 years, mind you. Um, so we feel as though we are clearly family. But the, the education that comes out of this uh, institution, the uh, tremendous uh, public and uh, community uh, um, interaction uh, 
uh, that has been generated. So the university provides not just an education for its students, but a, a cultural advantage to the entire uh, Santa Barbara community, which I am particularly appreciative of, uh, and someone who's enjoyed uh, lectures, uh, sharing, uh, breaking bread with professors, and um, learning about things that I never imagined in my wildest dreams would uh, would rise to the fore, but which actually do have an impact on the future uh, of our state. I'm also honored to serve as the convener of the uh, UC Legislative Roundtable. Uh, and the work that's being done here, the research that's being done at the University of California, in particular UCSB, is extraordinary and I think is a guidepost for the future. So there are so many wonderful things that are coming out of the UC and uh, UCSB. And at the same time, of course, there's always an opportunity to learn, to improve, to identify things that we may not have um, been as... Uh, as clear about and, and uh, things that we can do always to improve. So I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be part of this, to hear what some of those concerns are, uh, the good things that have been going on, and what we can do going forward to make it an even better experience for our students, our faculty, uh, and the community at large. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will uh, begin our hearing. I'm going to bring up uh, Chancellor Yang to uh, officially welcome us once again and give an overview of today's uh, hearing and then of course we're going to hear from different panels of those for budget facilities and capital uh, then a panel on enrollment outcomes city services and then finally uh, frankly we should have sometimes had this first but the student perspective so the student perspective as well as faculty so chancellor well Good afternoon, uh, Chairman McCarty, Assemblymember LeBoon, and uh, Senator Jackson. Uh, we are, and, and uh, our honored guest, we are absolutely honored and pleased to welcome you to our campus, and we are grateful for the opportunity to share with you some of UC Santa Barbara's achievements and their contributions. We also look forward to discussing uh, the challenges and opportunities our campus faces as one of the top public research university in California and the nation. With a history dating back more than 125 years, our campus has close ties to the history, prosperity, and the vitality of Santa Barbara County, as well as to that of neighboring Ventura and the San Luis Obispo counties. Established as a manual training school in 1891 and subsequently becoming the Santa Barbara State Teachers College, which provided educators for the area, UC Santa Barbara became part of the University of California system in 1944. The deeply rooted in teaching, research, and community service, UC Santa Barbara has flourished into a preeminent research university whose tremendous uh, impacts benefit not only the local region, but also California, our nation, and the world beyond. In September, US News and World Report ranked uh, more than 1,800 universities in the country. Among all public universities, UC Santa Barbara is number five. Uh, our success in the graduation rate of Pell Grant recipient was a new factor this year in our number five ranking. And according to a New York Times ranking of the top colleges most committed to economic diversity and doing the most for the American dream, UC Santa Barbara is ranked the number two. Uh, these rankings acknowledge our stature, not only as a top tier research institution, but also a special California state institution committed to academic excellence, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, and affordability. In 2018, we received nearly 110,000 applications, 92,000 for first year students, and 18,000 for transfers. I remember when I became chancellor in 1994, the number of freshman applications was 17,060. So the number has increased by 600%. This fall, we welcomed approximately 5,100 freshmen and 2,500 transfers to our campus. This year, I'm proud to say 
that we enrolled the highest number of California students in the history of our campus, including representation from 100 California community colleges. Mm -hmm. Our entrant class has an average GPA of 4.12 and is highly diverse with 30% underrepresented minorities and 41% first generation college students. We are one of 62 members of prestigious Association of American Universities, we call the AAU, and are the first member to be federally recognized as a Hispanic serving institution in 2015. AAU has since had admitted, uh, had a, a second HSI, so both are UC campuses. Our director of admission, Lisa Prescott, will talk about enrollment in more detail, but the achievement of HSI was the result of a more than two or three decades long strategy of outreach, numerous early education programs targeted at the K through 12 students in the state of California and creating a supporting campus community for students, including hiring diverse faculty and the staff. I myself, along with my wife Dylan and our faculty and the alumna and the staff teams have reached out annually to California high school graduates with diversity throughout the state at the nearly 130 regional receptions over two decades. As the demo demographics of our student body have changed, we have worked to develop innovative ways to serve our students through programming and initiative such as Transfer Student Center, the Promise Scholar Program, uh, the center uh, called uh, Opening New Doors to Accelerating Success, Dean of Undergraduate Education Jeff Stoppel and uh, uh, colleague Linda Adler-Kastner will be sharing information about our student outcomes. And uh, then there will also, uh, there's also uh, our food security efforts, which will be discussed in more detail by our Associate Vice Chancellor for Enrollment, Mike Miller. Uh, we owe a great deal of thanks to Assembly Member Monique Lamone for all of her efforts and uh, contributions during her tenure as a member of our campus community and uh, for her continued support as our uh, representative in the State Assembly. Uh, I also uh, want to like to thank Senator Jackson for her decades of support and uh, contributions. Uh, for example, uh, during the Thomas Fire and Mudslide, we, um, uh, Senator Jackson uh, and I, we toured the disastrous area. And uh, we also received, uh, I went to Sacramento, we also received help from uh, both Assembly Member Lamont and uh, Senator Jackson during the time of our needs. We owe a great, uh, we, uh, uh, our, uh, our distinguished faculty continue to be among our greatest assets. Six of faculty members have been awarded a Nobel Prize during the past 20 years. Uh, and in 2009, uh, UC Santa Barbara alumna also won a Nobel Prize. An analysis last year by Times Higher Education in London ranked the 750 universities worldwide for producing Nobel laureates in this century and UC Santa Barbara ranks number nine. Mm. We continue to focus on improving the diversity of our faculty by broadening our pools and creating programs and opportunities that attract the highly talented researchers and educators we seek to bring to our students. Voted the best place to work for the second year in a row by the readers of the Santa Barbara Independent we are the largest employ employers in Santa Barbara County and uh, serve as an economic engine for the Central Coast. Uh, our campus patents 90 new inventions and uh, spins off half a dozen new startup companies each year, most of which remain in the Santa Barbara area and uh, in California, thereby contributing to the local and the state economy. As part of our uh, support for entrepreneurship, we create uh, programs that provide business support for local companies. Among them are our California Nano Systems Institutes, Innovation Workplace, the newly opened Wilcox New Venture Incubator, and uh, the Golita Entrepreneurial Magnet Program. 
I would like to thank our legislators for AB 2664, which has helped to fund some of these facilities for innovation and entrepreneurship. You may be interested in knowing that Forbes magazine names UC Santa Barbara among America's most entrepreneurial universities, number 20 overall and number five among public universities. All of the programs that benefit our students, our region, and the state have been successful due to the steady and sustained support from the state, and we are all grateful to you. State support currently makes up 20% of our campus budget. We need to address the needs of our growing student body as we increase the number of California students. We will require more classrooms, dormitories, faculty, and staff. We also need to continue to produce the highest quality research, which has current and future impacts as an uh, economic engine of the state. I uh, also want to thank Assembly Member Chairman McCarty today. We went to see a, uh, a room of a triple room of a student in a student dormitory. Mm -hmm. We understand that it is our responsibility as a state institution to be focused on increasing other revenue sources. We have placed a greater importance on raising philanthropic support from our alumni and friends. These efforts have been rewarded with a significant increases in recent years, illustrating that others share our commitment to our educational mission. In addition, we continue to increase the number of research grants from the federal government and uh, from corporations and uh, foundations to help fund our activities. These play a critical role in supporting our educational efforts. Finally, we are exploring a new project with a third party vendor related to providing workforce housing on campus that we anticipate will help address housing costs, reduce traffic in the region, and uh, benefit the environment. However, the continued support from your committee and the colleagues in government is critical to having our campus and the University of California system remain not only the best public universities in the country, but also fueling the economic engine of the state and providing the best education to the citizen of the state of California. I have invited uh, our Assistant Chancellor for Finance and Resource Management, Chuck Haynes, to give a presentation on the financial health of our campus and the challenges we currently face, including the issues of deferred maintenance. Again, we warmly welcome you to our campus and look forward to the opportunity to, to share the stories of UC Santa Barbara's many accomplishments and some of our challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, starting us off. Thank you to Chair McCarty, Assemblymember Limone, and Senator Jackson. My name is Chuck Haynes, and I serve as the Assistant Chancellor of Finance and Resource Management only. Uh, the Division of Finance and Resource Management encompasses the Budget Office, Business and Financial Services, Audit and Advisory Services, Procurement, Institutional Research, Real Estate, Faculty and Staff Housing, and Capital and Environmental Community. Your packet you have uh, provides an overview of our campus budget as well as recent history of our revenue and expense trends. As noted, our budget has been relatively stable over the last five years. We are reliant on student tuition and fees and state appropriations for the majority of our revenues, with student tuition and fees comprising 37% of our overall revenues and state appropriations at 19. Other fund sources that make up our annual budget are largely restricted or designated fund categories, such as gifts, contracts and grants, and auxiliary enterprises. The vast majority of our operating expenses, nearly 66%, are for employee salaries and wages and employee benefits. It is fair to note that revenue growth has not kept pace with the recent surge in enrollment, wage and benefit cost impacts, and recruitment and retention efforts. Martin and I work with Chancellor Yang to stretch our resources to make ends meet. We utilize an array of strategies to match appropriate resources with campus priorities in the fulfillment of our mission. It is our office's role to work closely with our chancellor and collaborate with campus constituents on resource planning to further enhance the success of our students and faculty. 
Many new initiatives are established as pilot projects through the use of one-time funds. Others are established over a period of two or three years whereby we increase the permanent funds incrementally as resources become available and allow the program to gestate with initial one-time seed funding. Later this afternoon, you will hear from our colleagues on a few of these newer initiatives. We've also utilized revenues generated from our non-resident tuition to address funding gaps to somewhat restore programs that were reduced during the budget reduction experienced earlier this decade. The challenge of pushing experienced earlier this decade. The challenge of pushing limited resources further has long been part of our campus culture. We are a frugal and leanly staffed campus with roughly half our employee headcount comprised of student teaching assistants and student employees. Our high rate of student employment allows us to address a challenging local labor market and provides an important source of income and professional development for our students. While we have been a resourceful and innovative campus, many initiatives and early phase opportunities are not pursued due to fiscal constraints. The best funding scenario for our campus is one with predictable, consistent revenue growth over a period of time. Year-to-year -year financial uncertainties push our campus into a strategy wherein we protect resources committed to the essential basics and perhaps miss the opportunity to make additional headway in pursuit of excellence. We are accustomed to addressing budget, budgetary challenges. We are always appreciative of our partnership with the state of California in securing long-term financial viability. We can both say that funds invested at UC Santa Barbara bring about positive impacts in the lives of our students, faculty, and staff, and for the benefit of our state and nation. Perhaps even more importantly than the annual operating budget challenges we face, our campus is feeling significant and growing pressure from limited capital budget resources. We do not benefit from the varied financial resources available to campuses with medical centers and have a much greater reliance on traditional core funds such as state appropriations and student fees for our annual operations. This means our campus has fewer resources to draw upon when seeking funds to construct new instructional and research buildings or to address the ever-growing need for deferred maintenance investment. Over the past two decades, we have utilized the Garamendi mechanism to fund capital expansion. As you may know, this was a state program that allowed the campus to redirect an increment of newly generated indirect cost recovery from federal contracts and grants as a repayment source for capital debt. This mechanism allowed our campus to manage the balance between additional indirect cost recovery funds and our capital needs. While we were able to construct much needed space, this further reduced the amount of flexible funding needed to operate our campus. We believe we have leveraged this funding source as far as we can. STEM pro programs such as physics and engineering are amongst the more desired programs for today's UC applicants. Our ability to accommodate these hopeful undergraduates is impacted by a shortage of space. Our physics program is rated by the National Research Council amongst the top five programs in the nation since 2006, we've experienced a 300% increase in our undergraduate physics majors enrollment, and this trend's not slowing down. However, we've not seen an increase in permanent physics space since 1994. Our campus has undertaken a planning exercise to program and budget a new building to address the needs for additional physics space. We anticipate the need for a 125,000 square foot building with a construction cost of roughly 160 million to address that current need. Our campus simply doesn't have the fiscal resources necessary to address a facility of that magnitude. Our campus also anticipates a facility of similar size and construction costs for our engineering program. Our highly ranked engineering program is also in, in great demand from undergraduate applicants and experiences a similar need for instruction and research space. The likelihood of constructing new physics and engi engineering space is entirely reliant on capital funding from the state. In addition to our focus on laboratory buildings, all of our campus disciplines, including, including humanities and fine arts and social sciences, are impacted by a shortage of classroom space. As our campus enrollment grows, our dated classroom facilities are challenged to keep up with today's instructional needs. The last classroom building on our, that our campus constructed was completed in 1967. We have uh, recently received preliminary project approval from the UC Regents for a new classroom building to be constructed utilizing AB 94 funding as um, combined with campus funds derived from interest only. 
This building will provide more than 2,300 new classroom seats in support of undergraduate education. In addition to the pressing need for major capital investment, we are in the process of inspecting our facilities and cataloging our deferred maintenance backlog as part of a UC-wide initiative. At present, our best estimate of deferred maintenance for our state-supported facilities is nearly $600 million. Most of our buildings range, uh, are range in age from 40 years, and many of our major building systems are at the end of their useful life. In the past couple of years, we've utilized one-time state funds to address our greatest points of failure, but the backlog is significant and growing larger. Deferred maintenance has also presented challenges for many of our lab renovations as we recruit new faculty. Many of our newly recruited faculty need specialized laboratory and instruction spaces, and these sorts of re renovations can trigger building-wide system replacements and associated code compliance upgrades. Issues such as, the, such as these make the process of faculty recruitment even more difficult. In summary, we wish to thank you for the opportunity to highlight some of the challenges we face here at UCSD. Uh, we hope this brief presentation has been informative, and Martin and I are happy to answer any questions you may have for us. Okay. Thank you. Martin? That's, oh, that's, that's, that's a single okay. presentation. That's two for, two for yeah, one. Two okay. for. Gotcha. I do have a, Being a, a, a few questions. Sure. Um, as, I, as I noted earlier, I'm, I'm, we're, we're very aware of the uh, capital conversations, and as I told them earlier, whenever we go on a tour of a uh, college campus, we always go and see the crummy science lab whether it's a community college, a UC, or a CSU. So we know that uh, we invested in the era of the 50s and 60s building these great universities, and we haven't been around since. And so we, we know we need to address that. And so I think we will see some, some movement in the, in the legislature to do a higher education facilities bond like we used to have in the 90s and 2000s with some of the Delta County members. Now the, the bonds on the ballot have been the, the K through 14 bonds, and I think we should go back to the K 16 bonds to focus on the UCs and CSUs. So that being said, um, how much is currently being diverted from your, for, for example, UC Santa Barbara Lawton to, to uh, capital and facilities? I mean, uh, otherwise, it could go to uh, campus needs, uh, student services, expanding enrollment. You know, maybe paint, paint us a picture. Okay. Um, if, well, if, if even a back of the envelope. Yeah, that, that's probably the best I'm going to be able to do for you. Um, so our, uh, our overall expenditure on deferred maintenance on a year-to-year -year basis is about $4.5 million that we set aside on, in permanent funding. And in addition to that, if we have one-time funding, we increase that. Those are dollars that we have at the state, or sorry, at the university that we would have directed elsewhere on the campus if we weren't committing those to deferred maintenance programs. I think the, um, the other thing, and, and I've just got to give you kind of back of the envelope mm -hmm. estimates on that. There's, you know, at least somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six million dollars a year spent on lab renovations and facility renovations where we're utilizing indirect cost recovery from federal grants. And we're taking those dollars and turning around and investing them in renovation, lab renovation programs. If we weren't spending that money on those labs, we probably would be um, using that money for more of the instructional uh, center on campus. And then the last part, and I don't have a number off the top of my head, but it would be the debt associated with the DARE amending mechanism. And so that, that was a, a choice the campus made where we were able to take money that would have otherwise been used for instructional purposes and commit it to pay debt. Um, and we have five buildings, I think, that are DARE amending funded. Uh, and the largest one of which is uh, the bioengineering building, and I believe the DARE amending component of that was about a $45 million obligation. So the annual um, interest on all of those buildings combined is probably in the neighborhood of seven to eight million mm -hmm. on those. Mm -hmm. the, what's that? KITC, just yeah, the, 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 well, the, uh, land question. Yeah, we did receive philanthropy. Yeah, that's, I, I should note that, of course. Um, we had a donor who provided uh, uh, a donor-developed project to provide the residence for visitors of our Kavli Institute of Theoretical Physics. That's Charlie Munger mm -hmm. provided that. And that was a, a $65 million building that he um, mm -hmm. built for us. We didn't have to take something like that on. So if, if we have the great fortune of encountering a donor-developer, uh, that certainly helps those problems as well. 
My understanding, though, is that they basically tell you what you're going to build. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, um, you don't say no, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's th there's not a whole lot of uh, you know give and take there. Yeah, certainly, um, uh, donor interest in a project can have varying levels of control, but one one in which they're funding the entire thing, it, it is at a more at the donor discretion. Certainly in consultation with the campus, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does no. Mr. Munger have a relationship with Santa Barbara? Well, he does, doesn't he? He, he does. His uh, grandson was a student there. There you go. Good, yeah. good, good, good thing to have. Yeah, and he's been actively engaged with our campus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and those kinds of gifts come kind of once in a lifetime. Yeah. So. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, they are. They are very unique. We don't see gifts of that magnitude very frequently. Do you, do, uh, if I may, you sure. you did mention the housing problem. Um, which is a, a, a significant problem. This was the last university built within the coastal zone. Yes. Um, and as a result, building within it is, has been uh, quite a challenge and, and frankly, if I'm not mistaken, quite expensive. Yes. Um, with, uh, I, don't, I hope I'm not jumping ahead, but it seemed like a logical question to ask. Given the fact that you saw a room with three in a room that probably should have been for one and a half to two people. Um, how, how are you anticipating resolving that housing problem going forward? Um, there was a mention by the Chancellor, which I thought I did want to get a little more information about this workforce housing on campus with a third party vendor. Yes, yeah. Could you perhaps sure, I'd be happy share to. a little bit? And then also the whole housing issue. We don't have enough housing here. And uh, UCSB housing in Isla Vista is legendary. I won't say on what <laughs> level, but legendary over the course of years where you'll have eight or nine students in a house on, uh, uh, what is the, the, the uh, you know, I forget the street at the moment. I don't Del know Playa. what. Del Playa. Thank you, Del Playa. Yeah. That's uh, two or three bedrooms. So they create bunk housing in the living room and God only knows what else. They're very resourceful. but. Uh, there just isn't enough housing, and that's a serious issue. So if you could just address that and then this third party. Sure. Um, let me start with the third party project um, because that's one we're working on right now. I think I can work with this one mic here. I like the stereo effect though. Um, so Ocean Road is a project our campus uh, started working on in 2006, and the intent there is for us to build um, a major housing development that would be mixed use housing, so some retail or campus serving space on the first floor and residential above, uh, intended to be entirely for faculty and staff at UCSB. A component would be for sale and a component would be rental housing. And this was really our campus's attempt to address workforce housing on our campus. And so what's envisioned is a, a project that would uh, deliver somewhere in the neighborhood of 540 residential units and that would be combinations of one, two, three, and four bedroom units, um, associated parking. And our, our intent would be to take the area that, that's Ocean Road, which is currently the border of um, the campus with Isla Vista. I think when you walked to IV last night, you crossed it. It's a, it's a wide road. We're going to narrow the road. And there's a significant amount of campus land running along the north-south spine um, of the border of Isla Vista. And that would all be developed be faculty and staff housing. We're looking to do that with a third party developer. And so the intent is to find a development uh, agency that would come in and would enter into a long-term ground lease with the university, develop that housing, manage the rental component, and sell the for sale component of the housing to faculty and staff. We think um, you know, some of the, the major benefits of that are obviously bringing uh, our campus population closer to the campus, so folks who are commuting hours would have the opportunity to walk to work. Um, and we also think that uh, introducing a 12-month tw population to Isla Vista, mm -hmm. which is, you know, currently experiences uh, uh, some mass move-outs during the summer and during the holiday season, um, and then bringing in a different age population that would probably spur different sorts of businesses and really help mature the Isla Vista um, Business District. And I think that that's a, it's an excellent opportunity um, for Isla Vista and for the University of the Camp. It's a great example of a convergence, I think. Um, that, <coughs> that process, we are starting the early planning phase of that and we would intend to use uh, a request for proposal process, a public process, 
to identify the developers, and we think that'll happen at the beginning of this coming year. Mm -hmm. And so sometime in 2019, we'll be out on the streets looking for the development partner and hopefully make that move forward. It was included in our LRDP, so it has its preliminary approval from the Coastal Commission, although it will need a project-specific approval. Um, as to student housing, we have uh, uh, an agreement with the local community with our long-range development plan that we would build 5,000 beds to address our increasing enrollment through the year 2025. We built about 50 New beds, not replacement. New beds, new beds, new beds yeah, correct. Net new beds is the term I think we use. And, um, and that is uh, intended to um, uh, address all of our enrollment increments during that time. And so we've built 1,500 of those. We recently, uh, a couple years ago, opened our Sierra Madre complex. And then about a year and a half ago, I think it was, we opened uh, San Joaquin, which was 1,000 new bed and apartments around uh, Santa Catalina, the Tower Residence mm -hmm. Hall. Um, we are currently in the planning phase for the next phases of student housing. Um, and we are considering a, a, a variety of options of what the, the best way to go. Um, our LRDP envisioned redeveloping existing housing sites. And so going into what is currently Stork Apartments, uh, uh, San Ynez Apartments, and our West Apartments, as well as some of the Channel Islands residence halls that we toured today, to redevelop those areas and um, increase the density and build additional housing. Quick. Yeah. You know, I have heard from a number of college students uh, at UCSB and other schools because housing is such a shortage. We're, we're creating, I think, a very difficult environment for young people, uh, living three people to a room mm -hmm. uh, that's really not intended for more than two. Uh, and other things of that sort. The fact that you're gonna increase the density concerns me a little bit. Um, I, I'm told some of this can create health issues, mental health issues. Uh, I mean, I, I'm too old to envision being back in college and having to share a room with anybody. Yeah. Uh, um, it's hard enough sharing a house with a husband. Uh, but uh, uh, um, I think this is this is a concern. I, I, I don't know if it's yeah. within the scope of this well, discussion. Maybe you can clarify. But yeah. Density, I thought you meant multi-story. Multi-story. Oh, you're not yeah, talking yeah. about within, yeah, not, oh, not oh. Not more people in, a, in an individual oh, I, uh, good. bedroom. Not, not more people sharing bedrooms. Ideally, we would be decanting those students that are in, in three-person rooms into, into two-person two rooms. Yeah, that would, that would ultimately be the goal. But that being said, putting th two rather than three, are you actually increasing availability of housing or just making it more livable? Um, we would be increasing the availability. Okay. Yeah, that is the intent. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that, that, yeah. that I was okay. misunderstanding. Yeah. I just think we've got to take into account human behavior and trying to crunch a whole bunch of people into a room is, yeah. is uh, not good for, for one's, I think, mental and physical health. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. So you know, I had some budget questions, but let's stick, out, stick on housing for sure. a bit, because frankly, this is an issue not Santa Barbara, yeah. UC-wide, CSU-wide, and there are no easy um, solutions to it, and so we're trying to, to think out, outside the box. Um, you know, one thing that I've, I've, I've been seeing across California, even right in, in my district, in, in, in the, at the CSU at Sac State and UC Davis, is this um, the private development buying vacant land or underutilized strip mall across the street or a few <coughs> you know a mile away and uh, you know tearing it down and building multifamily housing there because the university you know we hear a lot about housing plans and yet with you know president napolitano talked about but that's not your bread and butter and you know your bread and butter is educating students and True. buildings and, and facilities and that's hard enough in and of itself but you know, doing massive housing developments is it, it is it's 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 not viable in my opinion. So um, <coughs> I know here you have your constraints of your um, you know constituents and your city council and so forth. My understanding is this area up here is not a city; it's unincorporated county, yeah. right? So what what how is that playing out? Because I know that they're seeing the crunch for their. I'm sure their work their workers in Santa Barbara the vacancy rates probably less than two percent. So, is there um, here among local elected officials a, a desire to 
to, to zone and, and title more land outside of the university. So that's my, my first thing is yeah. what's happening on the outside. Yeah. What do you say to that? Sure. Well, it, you know, it's an interesting environment for us here. So when we uh, went forward with our long range development plan in 2010, uh, the chancellor encouraged us to get out and meet with the representatives of the county of Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara and the city of Goleta, and actually negotiate the terms for what our development would look like and what were the conditions that, that they would find acceptable as we move forward. So we, we engaged in a multi-month process uh, with those folks. And one of the conditions they felt very strongly was that we had to absorb 100% of our enrollment growth on existing campus land. And um, they did not want us to buy any land from either Goleta or um, Isla Vista and develop that because there was a concern of that coming off the tax rolls. And so there was a real emphasis for us to build and develop on our existing land. And the terms we agreed to were that any housing built outside of what we were building on our campus wouldn't count towards our obligation um, in the long range development plan. I think there were some things we probably didn't understand at that time. We, we didn't quite understand what the makeup of Isla Vista was. Um, we thought it was just UCSU students and community, and um, I think there's a, a much larger population in Isla Vista, and as we built housing, Isla Vista kept back going, basically. Uh, the city of Goleta has, has uh, approved and constructed a, a significant amount of residential space both for sale and rental space. And their intent and desire is they would rather that be for um, non-students. And so what they, they've kind of looked at is, is this is for Goleta's growth and they don't want to see UCSD's growth consuming that housing. And so there hasn't been a mindset of saying, can the community build the housing for the university and, and we stick to just being the university. There was really a push for us to be self-sufficient in that. I think as we look and go forward, we have to consider options. Um, when we did the long range development plan, there was not a lot of third party development in the UC system. And now, as you know, it's, it's rampant. It's, it's mm -hmm. really the mode of developing student housing now more than ever. And so that's a change that we probably need to go back to the city and the county and talk through. Mm -hmm. Can you add something to that? How about you? That's okay. That's fine. I'm not saying you're right, Brian. That's good. Uh, back to the, the overall housing crunch, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's really twofold, the, the impact. It, one is the, just the debt load. Mm -hmm. You look at the debt load for the average UC or CSU graduate between 20 and 30 grand, and it's not tuition. I mean, I guess two thirds of your students here are gonna get Cal Grant, Pell yeah. Grant, or you know, UC Gold, or middle class scholarships that are paying minimal tuition to housing. And then of course, Access. If we have more housing, then we're going to get that pressure in the long run. Kind of makes the question obvious for more Californians and more of the people that are hitting you up at Trader Joe's. You know, they say land will be a south bill. It used to be Santa Barbara. So, um, what could this? What could we're talking all about problems here? Yeah. So, I, I know we talked about it with one family at a round table. Mm -hmm. That's what we had. Well, what could the state do to help either UC or education segment focus on on the housing issue for college students I have to admit I haven't thought of that uh, I, I, you know forever housing has been considered something that was a uh, self-supporting um, enterprise and so uh, it was never eligible for state support and so um, you know probably it would be in the incentives for developers and and spurring the development would be an area where the state could play a role. Okay. Is there an ent entitlement issue? So certainly, if you went and bought a vacant lot, you know, across the street in Isla Vista, yeah. for example, you have to go through the Santa Barbara County Planning Department and all that. But if you have it on UC land, you go through your yeah. process. Is there ever been thoughts as far as if it's university project within a certain area and any ideas about entitlement and well, that's, that's probably one of the great advantages the university has is being its own lead agency for entitlement purposes. And so that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that certainly is something that helps 
again we were in a situation where our local community didn't want us to expand our physical footprint into the neighboring communities and so you know it's it, it probably is um, the bitter pill of us buying property elsewhere is the impact on property tax I think that that's the thing that's yeah. uh, that would be difficult for the county if we come in and we buy something and take it off the tax roll um, if we're keeping it on the tax rolls that puts a challenge on the affordability and so there's a little bit of a vicious circle um, in, in that regard so if, if you if Santa Barbara bought land just across the street there in Isla Vista would you keep can you entitle it through the UC process yes or give, okay yeah yeah so when we buy it if it becomes regions land we entitle it through the UC process now we're still in the coastal zone so we still have to go mm -hmm. to the coastal um, Commission for any sort of approval of the development in the coastal zone we're to buy it across the street northwards um, and outside of the coastal zone then it would solely be at the regional scale entitlement level it is sort of the dilemma because the university's role is not to provide housing it's to educate students yeah. mm -hmm. on the other hand uh, uh, similar to the situation in Berkeley and I think at UCLA and Santa Barbara we don't have adequate housing for our students so it's a, a chicken and an egg problem uh, and I would suspect that not only are there some fiscal issues but I think in terms of land use and so forth I'm not sure Galita is excited about having more students and <coughs> out of this is unincorporated and that there are those issues and uh, you know it really is a bit of a dilemma but it does add to the cost of yeah. students coming to school when they have got to uh, pay exorbitant amounts of money for very little in the way of uh, a place to live and I, I don't know if UCSB has a problem but I keep hearing about different schools where some of our students are living in their cars and and uh, couch surfing and that's just no way to you, you can't study you can't focus you can't you know that's not acceptable and, and you know Senator you know, Jackson uh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, ac accommodating uh, student for housing is, is only one of the most important thing. Uh, actually, uh, because of the increasing in uh, in-state students, we want to accommodate more California mm -hmm. students. So we uh, we need more. Most present needs are the more classrooms, teaching, uh, learning facilities, and also uh, increase the number of staff to take care of them. Uh, the increase the number of uh, faculty members to give them better teaching and accommodation. And uh, then uh, building uh, uh, facilities for accommodate their living uh, environment I I is one of the very important thing. If the state can help us in the other areas like teaching faculty and all that, I think university, when we do well, we can also seek philanthropic support to help us with, uh, with, with the dormitories which we are doing pretty good. So we are still working on that. Okay. So there are all these overall problems. And if we can uh, accommodate more students, I think we can ease the, the needs in our Vista, which is one of uh, our current effort as well. Okay. I'm gonna go back to the budget. Um, and I appreciate the conversation about housing. I think historically conversations about housing in Santa Barbara County um, have been difficult whether we look at the lens from, um, from the student perspective or just from residents' perspective. Um, and, and I think that that will continue. Um, related to the budget, it was great to hear that uh, you know, things are going well now. Um, in the state legislature, we've also had conversations about what the future of California's budget looks like. And uh, one of the questions I know that uh, some of the folks that have followed the, the hearings at the state level have heard me ask that I wanna ask locally is, what are we doing to prepare for the next recession um, as a county? Um, undoubtedly, there will be one, and some predict sooner rather than later. And how are we preparing so that we don't see um, some of the elements that we've seen in past recessions that result in, you know, I mean, if you look at the history, that's when tuition has gone the highest, right, in the period of recessions. Um, and so forth, and that's also a very difficult time, but what is the campus doing now to think about that? Yeah, I would say, um, uh, you know, our role, Martin and I share the role of really being careful stewards of our funds. And so as we work on our year-to-year -year, um, allocations of funds, we're, we're very prudent about what receives permanent funding and where we put a permanent commitment, and that 
almost always is going to extrapolate to a staff member or a faculty member. And so it's really got to do with um, hiring people. So the more, the more our, uh, we would add to our workforce, the more we'd have a, an ongoing obligation that would be severely impacted in the budget cuts. And so I think at the campus, we've been frugal about our staffing. We've been, um, uh, we, we've been a campus that looks at how can we do the more with less and have focused on that. We are um, in, a, in a period where we're really looking at our various resources and trying to address the funding gaps that started in 2008 and how we've addressed those. I think an important dialogue we're gonna be having on our campus in the next couple of years is you know, what programs are really important to continue, um, what programs maybe shouldn't continue, and that's never an easy conversation to have. That's something that can help safeguard us, but it's really taking a look at where where are our permanent obligations and where are our um, less permanent obligations and trying to understand how we balance that. I think we've been, um, uh, we've been encouraging uh, folks to, uh, to look at their funds I and occasionally we have um, some gift funds where we really encourage folks to put those into funds functioning as endowments where they generate some interest revenue during the period with which they aren't spent. So sometimes we'll receive some source of funding that's intended to be spent over a seven to 10 year period and we know that spending period is coming a little later and so we're talking about investing that money right now so it yields some interest return in the, the meantime. Um, we're trying whatever we can to make ourselves a little bit more recession proof. I think the, um, the budget cuts we experienced in 2008 and then in 2012 were really difficult for our campus and we struggled to get our faculty FTE back up to the levels they were in 2007, eight, and we're, we're barely there. And so um, I, I would say we certainly haven't gone and overspent at present, and so that, that will in and of itself protect us a bit. Um, but I think uh, looking at uh, philanthropy and really growing that side of our campus has been an important part. Wherever we can look at something that's creating revenue is equally important. Quite frankly, we've seen a greater sharing of uh, campus obligations and financial obligations with auxiliaries on our campus where we've, we've taken the entities that are revenue generating and asked them to carry more of the, work, of the load. So some of those strategies have been helping us as well. Just to yeah, another it. most important strategy above all what we talk about is that we have gone through several recessions. I myself gone through it. But I think one of the most important principle is that we should have developed the principles that uh, no matter what we do, we must not compromise the, the quality of education and the diversity. So with these two large principles, then we make the budget cut and trim, and also uh, we, uh, we do it very carefully uh, with all what uh, Chuck just mentioned about uh, the ways to, to do the, to if it comes to the recession. But uh, we, w I think education quality and the diversity are the most important principle that we must not compromise. And just to add to uh, what Chuck was saying in terms of tactics, so uh, our permanent budget has been growing, there's been enrollment growth. Instead of having the, the permanent budget grow exactly with enrollment, we've tried to be a little more conservative with that and maybe lag a year or two. What if enrollment fi filled back? Or what if there were other pressures? So that's the specific tactics we've done with various fund sources to get that cushion that, that uh, Chuck described. Thank you. I have another uh, budget question for you. So I, I, I see here on the, um, the non-resident enrollment that of course has been a hot issue in the state legislature for the last few years and uh, the assembly pushed really hard a couple years ago and they needed to adopt a, a, a cap and then this past year in the budget, the Senate actually adopted language trying to go to lower to lower numbers, and so I thought um, you know it would be nice as well. And and so I for a lot of the campuses, it, it made a huge chunk of the revenue to to basically you know keep it going. And so some campuses like LA and Berkeley and San Diego that have you know more more money per student, and so their their academic quality, you could argue, is a little bit different than at uh, Merced or Riverside. So it looks like Santa Barbara is kind of in the middle of the BU people, but you have gone up in the last five years from 
from five to to sixteen, and so I assume that it's been a big chunk of um, of revenue. And some some um, <coughs> some of the UC campuses, I'm not sure they want to say it like this, but they're able to utilize their medical center revenue to help make it go a bit. So in my my district, I have UC Davis. I represent not the campus, but the, the medical center, which is a huge part of the UC Davis enterprise in LA and um, um, San Diego, of course. And so uh, maybe if you can paint a picture of Santa Barbara, how you're able to, uh, how it impacts the, you know, the average experience for your undergraduate students with not having the medical center and what you've been able to, where the monies go from the increased revenue for um, international and non, um, out of state students, and conversely, if you didn't have that, what it would look like for our students. Yeah, I can talk about the non resident part first. Yeah. So, out of, we have uh, $423 million of the budget this year from student tuition and fees, mm -hmm. and $113 million of that is the non resident uh, student fee. About a quarter of your revenue. Yes, 27% of that. And, of, and as you mentioned, that's grown over the last uh, couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a big chunk. And I, um, you want to address the other? Well, I, I would just say that, um, you know, it has become an important source of revenue for the campus. It's a, um, what I would call perhaps a more flexible form of revenue. And so um, it's something that we've utilized. Uh, we've uh, covered some debt expenses with it. We certainly have been dedicating those dollars towards the deferred maintenance program you mentioned. Uh, there have been a number of, of programs around student success. Some of the programs you'll hear about today. Um, uh, we've also been making investments in s sustainability with some of those dollars. Uh, and that's been a really important one for us because it has a kind of a twofer effect. It's meeting our goals as a campus for sustainability, but it's also managed to corral our uh, utilities expenses. And it's, uh, you know, our trends are very interesting. It's grown quite a bit over that period of time, but our energy use has not. And so that's from some of those investments coming that way. Um, I, I would just say in principle, in, in, in for me, philosophically, as I look at non-resident tuition, it's not the most comfortable source of revenue for me as a manager on the campus because it, it puts us reliant on the economy of other countries. And as long as those economies are generating the sorts of revenues um, and are, you know, they're productive enough that they're sending their students uh, and paying for non-residents, that gives us a source of revenue, but it certainly does make me worry when we have a potentially you know, disproportionate amount of what we're counting on as permanent budget coming from um, other nations and um, whatever their economic policies are. So mm -hmm. it, there's volatility associated with that. I don't think it is a, um, uh, you know, something that should be a long-term strategy to say keep growing that in, re in, um, in support of other funds going away. Right now, our total non-resident revenue non-resident tuition revenue is equal to about 50% of our state support. So it, it, it is a significant chunk of money um, on the campus that we are reliant on, but it, it does worry me. So the, the policy that the, the regents adopted uh, two years ago yeah. had, had a cap of you know, more than 18%. Yeah. So there's other campuses that weren't already yeah. above 20. Right. So that means that right now, Santa Barbara you're at 16% yeah. non-resident, and you could legally go up to 18, right? Yes. Is that the plan? Uh, I don't know. I think we, we've, you know, we've we have not made such a plan. No. But you I know, I have to say, out of state is not just international. Yeah. Out of state, yeah. meaning out of California. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other 49 states still mm -hmm. count. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, is, is there a huge uh, demand? Do you have way more applications for non-resident than you do slots available? I would have to have a director admissions answer that. I believe that is the yeah. case, yes. Well, you, UC wide, I know that's the yeah. case. Even, uh, even when we increase non-resident fee, there hasn't, you know, the whatever, the last two, three, seven, whatever, right. there hasn't had much of a drop. So th in other words, even there's this huge demand we could internationally and other states for the UC. Yeah, yeah, I believe that is true. I think for the other states, we are probably at the price point where we're almost priced out of the market. Uh, because of the non the non resident tuition combined with our tuition, mm -hmm. your housing expenses, and we have you know there's a policy that there's no financial aid yeah. provided to non residents, 
So there, we're, we're competing with you know what what may be the cost of other um, you know prime Ivy League schools. And so whether we price ourselves out of that market, I think Lisa can talk about that when she's up here. Um, it it. Um, but obviously, by going from in, in the last eight years, yep. you've quadrupled from four to fifteen. So there's a demand. People are there is telling them about the Santa Barbara story. Of course, we could walk out and see the beautiful ocean, and and, uh, and I think probably word gets out to other people in, in your home state or in your country and so forth about the experience you're finding on CSB. Certainly. Um, the, the one thing I, I did want to bring up, though, that, that you had mentioned, the, the, um, the language from the Senate about reducing yeah. non-resident enrollment down to 10% uh, of enrollment, that, that impact for our campus would be about $42 million in what we would now call permanent funding. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's almost equivalent to what the 2008-9 cut was for, uh, for UCSB when the UT experienced a very mm -hmm. large budget cut. Yeah. So it, it, it is significant. Let me ask one, one more question about student fees, and what I'm gonna say is very unpopular, but, um, but sometimes I wonder for the student fee increases if we shouldn't go forth with it in the first place because um, it really boils down to upper middle class students who, who are impacted. I think, I'm not sure the number here at, at UT Santa Barbara, but I think it's like well over half of your students pay no, no tuition at all. Because they probably have to tell. Sure. Is it two thirds? Is it half? It's it's over half. I don't know that number right off the top of my head. Off the top of my head. Yeah. And then two years ago, we adopted the middle class scholarship. Yeah. So now we go up to fund yep. two thirds of tuition for income. I think it's up to now one hundred and seventy thousand dollars roughly yeah. for for a family of four. And so, you know, that's a great uh, roar from the students. And so, if if it comes down to in, when you build your budget, you're looking for, my understanding is it's kind of a three-piece tool. Yep. Non-resident money, state money, and student yep. fee money. Yep. And so sometimes I just wonder, is it worth, I, I know that students, student fee is like the holy uh, third rail, um, and I get it, but um, you know, for many, many of the students who come and, and talk about student fee increases, we ask them, is it fair, what's your opinion? Yeah. Is, is it good financial or it's a, I it's a student squirming problem? Yeah, and I, I, I think that that is um, most likely an unpopular idea. I, uh, from, a, from a purely economics standpoint, there, there is a large segment of our enrollment that has their tuition covered. And so the idea of raising their tuition the return to aid component of that raised tuition assures that they are not impacted by that increase in tuition. Right. And so in effect, this portion of the population isn't paying it, um, and it's shifting that expense burden to the higher income student. That, that's the economics of it. The I, you know, somewhere around 2008, nine was when we kind of crossed the path with state funding being equal to student fee funding. And so it, it, they, they were each putting in about a buck each back then um, for, for, for the budget. Now it's swayed to where you know students are paying 37% and the state's at 19. And so that, that's really swayed quite a bit. And so I think that the, um, you know, there's, a, there's a concern about um, is, is there, if, the uni if the state can't restore funding similar to where it had been before, that pressure will naturally move towards tuition. I would just say for myself, when I came here as a freshman, my tuition was $248 a quarter. You know, it's a, it, it was a long, long time ago, and the state was in a much different um, place here. Well, the end of I think it's an important funding. question because it's a reality check, as, as, as uh, Member Ramon said. We've, we've had a five-year run in the economy in California to budget yep. like no other in 100 years, and yep. it's not going to continue. And it's just the laws of economics are going to have a reality check in yep. the near future. So we have to, to, to weigh those things up. I will note that, and this is one thing we always respect, is, is that the state increase has gone down, but that student fee revenue, keep in mind, we had a bunch of that state money as well. So when we increase fees, right. we pay to come, run the Cal Grant program. Cal program. And so Correct. if we look yep. at how much money from the state California checkbook is going to pay for college, and right. then that will be going – you see that it goes to student aid commission and backdoor 
which is so silly. Yes, Pell it's Grants, just a silly Park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. This was uh, helpful. And again, there's there's no magic thing we're looking for today. It's just helpful in understanding the decisions we make uh, year to year in Sacramento and how it impacts our, our sure. campus. Well, thank and you. I, and I think also, uh, you know, listening to you discuss this, I mean, it, yeah. uh, your um, um, conservative approach to funding has an impact on your, um, uh, you know, the folks who work here. Yeah. And I know that for graduate students, one of the keys to getting good graduate students is being able to offer them an opportunity to make a little money while they're here. And I know that the university has had some challenges because we don't offer them uh, particularly much. And instead of coming to UCSB, they go to the University of Texas or yeah. some other ungodly place. And, uh, you know, it makes it difficult for us to keep, to sustain that quality uh, of educational experience. Those researchers are helpful to the professors who want to have those students Absolutely. the top, you know, we want the cream of the cream here to be our students. So it's a, it's a, a yin and a yang here. We're not, uh, by being frugal, uh, it sometimes does also cost us the quality of, of student that we're looking for, particularly on the graduate level. So I'm mindful of that. and I. I appreciate the question, what do we do when the next recession hits? Yeah. Because I've been hearing from people that we're actually already beginning into that recession. Right. And so we have to uh, address those problems. The Chancellor's been working overtime on getting philanthropists to contribute to the school. I don't know how much more we can expect him to do. Um, any any know, more Munger grandkids at the end of all? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I will stand silent on that. but. Uh, there certainly are folks out there who do appreciate this great university, uh, yeah. but that we can't rely on that yeah. uh, for our programs. Okay, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you for, for your time this, today. This panel next, we're going to have a uh, panel on enrollment outcomes of student services. So please come on up, our four participants. Thank you, Chair McCarty, Assembly Member Lamone, and Senator Jackson. I'm Jeff Stoppel, Associate Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Education. With me here is Linda Adler Kastner, Faculty Director for the Center of Innovative Teaching, Research, and Learning. We appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about UC Santa Barbara's innovative 360 degree support for achievement of our rigorous learning outcomes. We'd like to thank the legislature for the support you've provided for some of these initiatives. So we want to reiterate a few of the points that the Chancellor has made. UCSB students are more accomplished than ever. As we've noted, our student body is also increasingly diverse. 30% identify as underrepresented minorities, and 41% are first-generation college students. He also emphasized that we are the first member of the prestigious Association of American Universities to be certified as a Hispanic-serving institution. Additionally of note, is that 30% of our students come from families with an income below $50,000 a year. This matters for learning. Family income correlates most strongly with educational preparation and achievement. One consequence is a gap in GPA and time to completion for some of these students. To address this gap, we've created innovative programs to develop thriving learners. We refer to them as 360 degree programs because they support learners and faculty. We know that learning is a two-way street. Students need to be prepared to learn from faculty, and faculty need to know how to best invite students into a learning process. After all, learning is something that someone does, not something done to them. Learning takes practice, feedback from experts, and time. Our program helps students develop three parts of an equation that lead to success in college and beyond. Disciplinary knowledge, skills for academic and career success, and senses of themselves as learners. We'll share illustrations of programs we've created in conjunction with each piece of this equation. We'll also share with you ways we hope you can help us advance this goal. First, we'll choose academic success centers, uh, the ONDAS, or Opening New Doors for Accelerating Success Student Center, that the Chancellor previously mentioned, and the Transfer Student Center. Both support entering students, especially first-generation and low-income students. Both opened in 2015. The ONDAS Center with support from a $2.5 million HSI grant from the U.S. Department of Education, and the Transfer Student Center with support from $1.6 million in special student success funding from the UC Office of the President. Both provide academic advising, academic mentoring, 
structured opportunities for students to get to know faculty, and workshops focusing on all aspects of college life. Collectively, more than 6,000 students have visited these centers, most more than once. 40% of the campus's total transfer population, in fact, uses the TSC regularly. UNDOCS and the TSC illustrate the comprehensive support that UTSC provides to students to meet our institution's rigorous learning outcomes and develop senses of belonging here. We know that this opportunity support also extends beyond the students. We have worked with faculty across campus to develop innovative pedagogies to make their expertise more accessible. For instance, 39 faculty have participated in a year-long seminar supported by the Department of Education Title V grant. They have redesigned assignments and courses to improve student learning. By the end of fall quarter 2018, these 39 faculty will have taught more than 38,000 students. And that is only one example of this kind of programming. Collectively, all of these efforts contribute to improving students' learning and improving retention and time to degree. Through all of this work with faculty and students, we have identified important practices that contribute to learning gains. We'll share just two of them. The first is incorporating active learning in teaching. In Professor Steve Gowland's large biological anthropology lecture course, for instance, students watch video lectures, take online quizzes, and submit questions about cor course content in advance of class meetings. In class, they discuss their questions with each other and with Professor Gowland. This active learning approach makes the most of face-to-face -face class time through interaction and engagement. Research shows that this approach contributes significantly to learning, especially among underrepresented, low-income, and first-generation students. The second is academic mentoring, especially from undergraduate peers. Right now, eight departments have such programs, which contribute significantly to learning gains. We are also using technology for this support. We collaborate with the University of Michigan on eCoach, a technology platform that provides course-specific coaching written by humans to support learning and study strategies tailored for students. eCoach was initiated using $1.7 million in one-time funding we received from the legislature to support low-income students, students from underrepresented minority groups, and students enrolled in local control funding formula schools. To conclude, we want to identify two ways we hope you can support our 360 degree approach. First, the legislature can provide stable, sustained support for programs that help expose the achievement gap for all learners. The programs we've described here have been supported by student success funding from UTSC, grants like the one from the Department of Education, and LCFS Plus funding from the legislature. Of these, only student success funding from UTLC is permanent. The campus is trying to sustain funding for these programs and others like them that support time to degree and success. Second, you can help us create spaces for learning. As we've noted, everyone has. UCSB is one of the most beautiful campuses on the outside, but classrooms and labs, as you've noted, don't necessarily match the exterior. We don't have space for our booming student population. Learning spaces are in desperate need of renovation, built at a time when we knew less about the importance of active learning pedagogies for learning gain. This support is critical, even as we plan for a new classroom building. Investments like these, for efforts like these, funding and, um, that is predictable and sustained can help us make a difference here at UCSB and more importantly, a difference for California. Like you, we believe that all of our students are learners and citizens and together we can build a better future. Thank you and we'll look forward to any questions you have. I like the team uh, picture. <laughs> 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 So one of the things, if I may, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, yes. jump in here. Uh, one of the things that we look for in the legislature and is frequently um, lacking is some metrics. So how much money have you spent? How many students have you addressed? What are the success levels? How are you measuring success? If we're going to put more money in and help make this permanent, which is what I just heard you saying we need, tell us how well this program is working. I think it's too soon to say how well it's working. Graduation rates take time to, to measure. We hope to see improvements in graduation rates, um, particularly for the transfer students. Uh, that's a real concern for us. I think that will be important. Yeah. Tell us, uh, I mean, if you have a program that works, I suspect we're gonna wanna implement that elsewhere mm -hmm. if it's the best program out there. But that is, I think, something that uh, becomes important is, is tell us how, how well it's, it's accomplishing its goal. And we, 
we absolutely concur with you that assessment is extremely important. This is one of the major areas of focus of my work and our work as uh, the Office of Undergraduate Education. One of the challenges is that learning gains take time to manifest themselves. So if we implement an uh, intervention, it could have short-term results. It can have different kinds of long-term results. And so we have data on some of the short-term results of some of these. And we just recited to you a sort of suite of um, different kinds of interventions and programs. So we have data on some of them. But 2015 is not long ago, so we need more time so to see the long-term interventions. So are you measuring uh, these students, whether they're graduating or not? What, what if some of them are at risk of, of mm -hmm. failing or they, sure. they come in and they're not totally prepared? You know, you're doing X, Y, and Z. The Absolutely. goal, I mean, p part of it too is what is the goal? Is the goal to see them graduate? Is the goal to see them get jobs? Is yeah. the goal to see them uh, go on and get other degrees? I mean, those are things I think that would be helpful for us to know what it is you're measuring. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. These programs are specifically focused, I think, in, in getting students to graduate on time. There's uh, a lot of other wonderful things that the, the campus is doing in terms of steering students into graduate programs, and that's appropriate. There's Mayor Scholars and UC Leaders and many others. We, we didn't choose to focus on that here. Um, the jobs thing is trickier for us to get a handle on. Uh, our office doesn't have that kind of data, unfortunately, about where they go. We know, for instance, so one of the programs that I mentioned was uh, this eCoach, which is a tailored coaching program written by humans for students. Um, so we have data from the initial pilot runs of that uh, intervention in a, one of our big introductory biology courses, and we've seen some very positive results. But that means, for example, that we've seen changes in students' uh, self, their beliefs in themselves as students, their study behaviors, their study practices, their grades from one biology course to the next biology course. But that's but in the time that we've had, that's those are the metrics we can collect right now. So some of the longer term uh, interventions, like um, changes in faculty members' teaching practices, those take longer time to collect data on. Any other questions? All right, so I think we will have the next set of panelists. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name's Lisa Prescott. I serve as the Director of Admissions. I've proudly worked for the Department of Admissions since my graduation in 1985, 33 years if you're doing the math. I thought it would be best to start with the mission of the Office of Admissions. Quite simply, we're charged with enrolling a student body that demonstrates high academic achievement, exceptional personal talent, and reflects the diversity of California. We accomplish this by providing services to families and educational professionals throughout California. Our services can be broken down into the following categories, statewide outreach, application services, online services, and counselor services. Statewide outreach includes in-person visits with students from as far south as San Ysidro High School near the Mexican border to the northernmost community college in California, College of the Siskiyous, which is 50 miles south of the Oregon border. Our application services unit ensures each application is thoroughly reviewed. In preparation to submit a 2019 UC application, students can view the tutorial that we've created and posted to YouTube. The tutorial has received nearly 11,000 views and is commonly used by California counselors to advise students on their campuses. UCSB on, UCSB's online tools ensure families who lack the ability to travel to campus have access to the information they need to prepare for the university. These tools were created at the suggestion of counselors from low-resource California high schools who expressed concern that their families did not have the resources to visit each UC campus. While these tools are available to anyone with internet access, approximately 85% of the users are from California. Lastly, our, our counselor services provide tools and resources that school personnel use to best serve their students. The Office of Admissions is comprised of 50 dedicated staff members, many of whom are UCSB graduates. All are passionate about creating educational access. Many of our staff, myself included, are first generation students. We understand the challenges and roadblocks on the path to attaining a college degree. I'd like to highlight some examples of our successes and I'll follow that with some specific services that we provide families in California. Fall 2017 marked the term that UCSB exceeded a total African-American undergraduate enrollment of 1,000. 
This was achieved through long-term outreach program development and a commitment by the campus leadership to fund these initiatives. Personal attention matters when it comes to making crucial enrollment decisions. UCSD takes pride in the personal service. An example of this would be our postcard campaign that we coordinate in the Office of Admissions. Last year, more than 13,000 underrepresented students received handwritten postcards from faculty, staff, students, congratulating them on their admission to the university. Chancellor Yang mentioned our reception. Since 1994, Chancellor Yang has hosted 128 receptions throughout California for top applicants. In total, these programs have served more than 66,000 students and parents. More than 100 UCSD representatives participate in each program. The receptions are an example of campus-wide collaboration among administrators, faculty, alumni, staff, and current students to bring the best students to UCSD. We're proud of our reputation for excellent service. Counselors regularly share with us that UCSD is the office they're going to call when they have questions. The entering class of fall 2018 reflects the success of our long-standing outreach programs. 41% of our new students are first generation and 30% of that class underrepresented minority groups. There's definitely tons more work to be done. Um, I'll give you now some examples of some of our specific initiatives. Uh, service to California high schools remains our top priority. Each fall, our outreach team visits approximately 950 high schools, providing information about the UC system and UC Santa Barbara specifically. Typically, we reach between 90,000 and 100,000 students during those two months of fall outreach. High school students enrolling at UCSD for the fall term 18 reflect the most academically talented group of students in our campus history. Mm. A unique program we coordinate is our most influential teacher award. Each year, we ask incoming freshmen to nominate a teacher who has impacted their lives. These teachers receive a certificate and a thank you letter and a UCSD poster to display in their classroom. And a copy of that letter is also sent to their principal, acknowledging their contribution to our student success. Service to California community colleges is another key priority. UC Santa Barbara is the only UC to visit every California community college during the fall application cycle. We have done this for the last three years. Mm -hmm. UCSD maintains a transfer guarantee programming program ensuring that students from any California community college have access to our campus. We currently have one admission counselor based in Sacramento. Uh, this allows us to provide year-round services to Northern California community colleges. Our commitment to diversity is reflected in our enrollment achievements. I've already mentioned postcard campaign, but I'd like to share a few more examples. I have samples for you today of our resource guides um, that address the unique informational needs of underserved populations. We were the first UC to create these guides. These include informational guides for American Indian, Chicano Latino, African American, Asian American, and foster youth. We also produce guides for veterans, LGBTQ communities, and low-income families with basic needs. Uh, a few of these guides are still at the printer. I brought you a sample of just a few of them. Our LA to SB program provides low-resource Los Angeles schools with a campus tour experience that includes bus transportation from LA to Santa Barbara, lunch in the dining commons, and a student panel where students can hear from UCSD students who come from similar backgrounds. Through special funding from the campus, we have two full-time professional admission counselors dedicated to diversity initiatives. One is stationed in Los Angeles, the other is here on campus. Together, these admission counselors create special programming serving first-generation students. Particular attention is focused on community-based organizations. We have a close relationship with programs throughout the state, such as the Council of African American Parents and the William Douglas Foundation in Southern California and the Young Scholars Program in Hayward. UC Santa Barbara is the only UC to employ an advocacy model of outreach. Every American Indian, Chicano Latino, African American veteran and or foster youth applying to UCSD is assigned an admission counselor designated as their advocate. The advocate makes certain that every applicant has a one-stop <coughs> liaison. So if they have any 
questions about any campus services, financial aid, housing, whatever the case might be, they have one <coughs> person that they can call to help them navigate the campus. That advocate works with the student from the point that they apply until if they're admitted and ultimately enroll at UCSD to the point they move into the residence halls. We maintain close relationships with UCSD student organizations who are committed to helping with diversity initiatives. One partnership is with the Black Student Union, campus leadership who's provided admissions with permanent funding to create outreach programs that focus on African American high school and community college students throughout California. Our service uh, to campus visitors is very comprehensive. The Visitor Center serves approximately 54,000 guests annually. We provide a virtual tour available in Spanish, Mandarin, and Korean for families who cannot visit in person. Faculty in more than 50 classes per quarter open their doors to our campus visitors who want to have the opportunity to experience a lecture from an esteemed faculty member. Finally, our online services are available to those who are not able to meet with admission counselors in person. These services include webinars, virtual transfer advising appointments, online chat, virtual classroom presentations to avid classrooms, and online college fairs. We also have an expansive array of videos available to students on our YouTube site with specific videos produced for African American, Chicano, Latino, transfer, and foster youth. Again, these online services are used predominantly by California students and counselors. For instance, 89% of our webinar viewers are from California. We do face some challenges as we create and implement our outreach services. Success can be hampered if our funding is not consistent across fiscal years. In general, most successful initiatives take two to three years to fully mature and to take root in California high schools and community colleges. While we're tremendously grateful for any new funding, even one-time funding, if the funding is one year only, it is more challenging to realize long-term results. Comprehensive review of the application uh, is critical. Um, we need to fully understand the talents of a particular student beyond just GPA and SAT. Reviewing 110,000 of those applications is a massive undertaking. Uh, we use a team of about 150 readers that must complete this arduous task in about 10 to 12 weeks' time. Applications are far more complex than when I began in this profession. For example, California community colleges are offering a very large array of what are called dual enrollment classes, mm. community college courses offered on the high school campus. Many high school students are completing these courses. In addition, they're taking online courses, they're attending summer programs at different colleges and universities. So these programs definitely make <coughs> the student more prepared for university level work, but it definitely creates a much more complex application to review. The mandated two to one ratio of freshman to transfer enrollment is especially challenging to a campus like UCSD that's more geographically isolated than most of the other UCs. There are only two community colleges in Santa Barbara County. Combined, those two community colleges bring us only 17%, 17 to 18% of our total transfer enrollment. Mm. So that basically means we are far more reliant than other UCs to bring in out of area students to the campus to hit that two to one mandated ratio. Outreach to special populations such as underrepresented minority groups, transfer students, veterans, and foster youth require time-intensive services. Again, our geographic location means that we must travel throughout California to reach these communities. Simply put, the geographic location of Santa Barbara makes outreach more expensive. Demand for STEM majors is at an all-time high. This creates tremendous uh, demand for lab space and teaching assistance, which has been mentioned already today. While the campus is working to address these issues, admission staff must work diligently to help students discover majors across all disciplines. Any type of specialty outreach program requires labor intensive services. Finally, competition to enroll our most talented underrepresented California students is fierce. The biggest concern is financial aid. Our low income families are near panic when they see the total cost of attendance and middle-income families are deterred by fear of student loan debt. Admission counselors spend significant time addressing these concerns. 
colleges from outside California are now placing regional representatives within California to recruit our most promising students away. These schools offer scholarships that often cannot be matched by UC. The historically black colleges and universities now recruit heavily in California and host college fairs at, at key California community colleges. The HBCUs have also developed guaranteed admission programs with the California community colleges that are competing with the UC guaranteed program. I thank you for your time and your interest in our outreach programs. I hope this, inter this overview uh, demonstrates our passion for service uh, and our commitment to California schools and families. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Mike Miller. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Services. I'm here to share some of our innovative work around critical issues like access, affordability, and basic needs. Thanks to our generous financial aid awards and several, several new programs around student support, UC Santa Barbara was re recently ranked number two in the New York Times College Access Index, which ranks colleges and universities for their support of low-income students. While we are proud of our number two ranking, we also, we also know that we have a lot of work to do in, in these areas. With the rising cost of higher education and constantly evolving needs of our students, UC Santa Barbara continues to look for ways to ensure student success. As my colleagues have said, predictable funding models are vital when trying to plan ahead. This is something our students also struggle with. Traditional financial aid models determine eligibility on a year-by-year -year basis. This means low-income, first-generation college students commit to a campus only knowing how they'll, they'll pay for one year of their education and are often left to wonder about years two, three, and four. Four years ago, UC Santa Barbara launched a pilot program designed to address this issue called the UCSB Promise Scholar Program. The program offers talented, high-need high incoming freshmen a predictable four-year financial aid out outlook using existing financial aid programs. Transfer students are offered two years of predictable funding. Promise scholars are al also offered a number of what we call wraparound services to ensure they thrive in the classroom as well as in, in the UCSB community. Here's what we've learned so far. The model of predictable funding and wraparound services is working. We currently have 415 students in the, in the program and of those, 123 are in their fourth year. Of the students we welcome to campus in the first year of the program, all but one remain enrolled and on track to graduate. A remarkable 93% are, are on track to graduate in four years or less, and to date, the overall GPA for the entire program is a 3.3. To put this in perspective, the average household income of our Promise Scholars is less than $25,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Under normal cir circumstances, we know many of these students would be at risk of having to drop out or stop out during their academic careers due to financial hardship. However, however, under our model, they are thriving, graduating, and graduating on time. Last fall, UC Merced launched a multi-year financial aid program, and other UC campuses are exploring similar, similar efforts. Another program we recently implemented that is seeing positive results is our financial crisis response team. National research shows that when college students drop out or stop out, it is almost always due to financial obstacles that tend to be less than $500. Last fall, UCSB launched this, this program, which is designed to catch students before they fall through the cracks. A diverse committee meets to review student appeals for emergency funding and also connects them with other campus resources. The financial crisis response team proved valuable in the wake of the recent wildfires, and the committee is currently working to support students who lost homes in both the Woolsey and Camp Fire. Last year alone, more than 500 students contacted the financial crisis response team and we're happy to report that this, that this safety net program is keeping students on campus and enrolled in classes. In a recent UC-wide survey, nearly half of the undergraduates who responded reported being food insecure. With this in mind, the Global Food Initiative and great efforts like SB 85 were launched. UCSB has taken those resources and implemented some impactful programs to ensure our students have access to healthy and, nutri and nutritious food. Our faculty, staff, and students are passionate about food security. Back in 2011, student leaders launched a campus food bank. In its first week of existence, the food bank served five students. Fast forward to today, more than 1,600 students per week access the campus food bank. Mm -hmm. UCSB is also leading the way in terms of accessing the CalFresh program. 
Nearly th last year, nearly 3,000 students took advantage of the program, resulting in over $5 million in purchasing power for our students. This year, we're on pace to enroll, enroll 6,000 students in that program, far more than any other UC campus. UCSB continues to educate students on things like cooking healthy meals, shopping on a budget, and much more. The campus also recently broke ground on a student farm which will supply our food bank with fresh produce and serve, a, serve as a laboratory for our faculty and students. Thanks to funding from sources like SB 85, UCSB is quickly and effectively addressing food insecurity. It is important to note the leadership of Assemblymember Lamone around SB 85, which is designed to create hunger-free campuses across California. This fall, we also started a housing voucher program to help students who are facing short-term housing emergencies. Through the Financial Crisis Response Team, students can apply for vouchers for up to $500, which can be used for on-campus or off-campus housing situations. These are just a few of the innovative and intentional programs UCSB has created to help students thrive while on campus. Looking ahead, many of these programs have been started using one-time funding, so it is important to find long-term and predictable funding sources to ensure these programs remain in place. Thank you for your time and your continued support. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I'll have a few. Yeah. So, um, first of all, as uh, the en enrollment, I just have a couple of questions on that. Um, obviously, it's a coveted uh, UC system in, in Santa Barbara. <coughs> just, just want to know if you could kind of paint a picture, the the odds of getting in now <laughs> versus kind of ten years ago. Right. And then. Sure. Um, well, officially, uh, the data is 32% admit rate for UC Santa Barbara at the freshman level mm -hmm. and 51% for transfer students. So that means a third of the students who apply will ultimately be admitted to Santa mm -hmm. Barbara. Um, we definitely have become a much more competitive campus. Um, I would say from the point that I started here, we were essentially an open access campus. We were not selective at all. And that really has been a hard thing for the public to adjust to. You know, we now have six Nobel Prize winners. We are ranked number five U.S. News and World Report. Uh, we try to explain to students that we really should not be considered a backup choice campus anymore, that mm -hmm. Santa Barbara is in the big leagues now, and um, there's tremendous demand with the 110,000 applications. So um, what, what's the average? Average GPA is a 4.12. Mm -hmm. um, average SAT is in the range of 1,300 plus. Mm -hmm. And know. so if, if you're a um, community college transfer mm -hmm. student, do you get 50%? Yeah, community college transfer student, the average, uh, well, we have our guarantee program that uh, says if a student has 60 transferable units with a 3.2 and a few courses completed specifically in math and English, they're guaranteed admission to UC Santa Barbara. No matter Barbara. what community college they apply? No matter what community college. And so if, if, if people come down here and enroll at Santa Barbara City College, mm -hmm. and we're, we're going to go visit them tomorrow and yes. talk about this, uh, do their odds increase? No, they do not. Um, a bit of a myth that's out there that your chances are better. I think the, the difference would be counselors at Santa Barbara City College are very familiar with UCSB, our department, mm -hmm. and our selection process. Yeah. So students get very good advising from the counselors at Santa Barbara City College, but a student at College of the Sequoias has an equal chance under the guarantee. Sure. So the guarantee isn't that you guarantee that they'll get into UCSB, it's a guarantee they'll get into a UC campus. No, it's a guarantee that they will get into UC Santa Barbara. Six of the UC campuses have campus-specific guarantees. You, you choose one campus. You choose one. one. Address. So and I'm a student at, at City College, uh, Santa Barbara mm -hmm. City College. I have a th I have the the minimum requirements. I apply to UCSB and I'm automatically accepted. Guaranteed. Or whatever of the six students. Yeah. Yeah, My so daughter actually three did point that two. Three point two. And each each cal each UC that participates it's their own criteria for their guarantee. The guarantee here at Santa Barbara is a three point two. So again, if you were at Santa Barbara City College, Santa Monica, San Diego, 3.2, 60 units, um, 
a transferable math through transferable English, you're guaranteed. And yet, I, if I recall, you said that, that the transfer students from our two uh, community colleges in Santa Barbara County only represent 17% of your transfer enrollment. Of your enrollment. Of our transfer enrollment each year. Yeah. So how many students actually apply from City College or from oh, from Santa Hancock? Barbara City? It's about between 900 and 1,000. Um, I'd have to pull the data from the most recent years, but it's, it's actually been declining because Santa Barbara City College's enrollment has been declining. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. On the agenda, it says that uh, to, to create an increase by 30% with community college transfers, but freshmen have gone down. Right, yeah. transfer. And that's one thing, too, if, if you look, you know, that's all great, but I suppose it's the California family that we're talking about many times is a freshman, of course. I understand. Mm -hmm. And that the, in, in 2009, there was 19,015 freshmen, and this year, 19,340, so little over 300 more freshmen and non-resident increased from 780 to 3,700 so mm -hmm. over 3,000 so mm -hmm. it's a bit of a, 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 a rub to California in, in that gap. We get that question quite frequently like like I tried to say our priority is still California 86 percent of our outreach that we conduct in the office is California um, there is something called Compare Favorably that our faculty hold all the campuses to, and that is all students must meet the same academic standards. So with the number of applications we have, again, trying to grow the campus academic profile, once a student is in the application pool, we're evaluating all aspects of their application. We do want diversity, whether it be geographical within California, whether it be ethnic, whether it be national and global. We do maintain a clear understanding and belief in the Regent cap of 18%. The campus at Santa Barbara is at 16%. We feel like that gives our students um, great global exposure. Um, at the same time, we're also promoting our students to study abroad and bring back that knowledge from their study abroad program. So we think we're at a good balance and right now. And compare favorably, we did tighten up the law last year. So now, yes, specifically, you, you can't be close. You have to equal to or better than the California students. So and we do meet standards. those standards. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask about the outreach programs. Or mm -hmm. I'm a big supporter of them, and I, I guess they're not called outreach anymore. Say PEP. Um, there are some programs that yeah. receive special funding called SAPEP. Gotcha. Um, our some of our transfer yeah. outreach programs. But are the big SAPEP. the big question is that twenty years ago, fifteen years ago, I think the two recessions ago, mm -hmm. there was a huge influx. Um, I think a hundred million dollars through the programs, and there's a student centered ones. They're like the Mesa mm -hmm. kind of deal, deal to you. That's done very very well. And there's the school centered ones, and right. that's reforming the schools and. Santa Maria or Mesa Correct. Lodo, whatever, the Ventura, the, the pipeline. Mm -hmm. and that's a lot of work and a, a lot uh, of money. And the mm -hmm. student center ones is where you find students who are on the bubble mm -hmm. and, and you get them closer. So you can't, it's, it's transformed thousands of students that you could maybe hand pick. And so mm -hmm. some would say that's kind of creaming because you're just getting p people who are just about there. Um, what do you think? What do you think the worthiness of, of those, and, and what could we do to, to, to if, especially if we want to focus on, uh, you know, diversity of our of our of our UC system and right. enroll more African American and Latino students. And right. Uh, I think you need a combination of both. You know, you need a combination of both. I mean, we're frequently in our outreach encountering phenomenal students with phenomenal GPAs. Uh, from you know, first generation families that had no idea that they would even be competitive. They, you know, you talk to them, it's like, well, I think I'll probably just go to my local community college, which is not a bad option. It's an option I took as a first generation student, but without fully realizing the financial aid that was available to me. So the admissions office meets thousands of those kinds of students, and we are talking to them about. Great, have community college as an option, but let's get your application into UC as well and 
and uh, let's see if we can make that work for you. At the same time, I think our early outreach programs that are funded through those SAPEP funds mm -hmm. um, are essential to creating that pipeline for the families that just really have no background knowledge of higher education. Um, Ms. Lamona and I go way back working with a local program in Santa Barbara called CalSOAP. And, you know, CalSOAP is a program that works with first generation families, it's state funded. And the immediate outreach offices like mine work in close conjunction with those programs. So at the same time that we're doing sort of the large scale blanket covering of the state of California, we also work very closely with those SAPEP programs. Mm -hmm. um, I think you need both. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm curious um, about the co uh, Community College Promise Program and the impact mm -hmm. it's had on admissions or maybe it hasn't had an impact. Um, on the community college side, we have seen an Im unbelievable statewide enthusiasm for these Promise programs at the right. community college. Um, and we're just trying to identify is some of the anecdotal information that we've received equivalent to what you're all starting to see or is it too early to tell um, because it hasn't really been adopted uh, in, a, in a kind of a stronger way at the statewide level. Mm -hmm. It's just starting. Certainly our community college, Santa Barbara City College, has adopted. I just wonder if you can speak to that. Yeah, I'm definitely starting to see some of the results of that. Um, I think there are great options for students. I am starting to see more students consider the community college as a first choice option as a result of those promise programs. I think that especially, you know, high performing community colleges like Santa Barbara City College that also offers honors programs in conjunction with their promise programs are very enticing to families. I Can think I ask you a question mm -hmm. about that comment? Mm -hmm. From your perspective, is it enticing to all families or are they, are the combination of promise and honors enticing to families that um, or, or students that come from families who are not first generation, who are not right. low income. I mean, right. that's. I think, as, as you've mentioned, um, this demand for UC, there's a prestige that goes with UC, and families want that prestige. And there is a certain set of families, usually the non uh, first generation, mm -hmm. those with college experience in their families, that typically were not considering the community colleges before. Um, and would, in our outreach effort, sometimes even be a bit offended if we brought up a transfer option. And I am now seeing those families locally looking at Santa Barbara City College in a way they hadn't in the past. Uh, again, I also see that first generation family who often thinks that's their only option. And again, it's a great option if they've done all their research and determined that's the best fit school for them. I just too often see students assume that the four-year universities are not an option. And I, I like to encourage students to explore it all. Thank you. Does that answer your question? It does, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. And um, all four of you spoke about the importance of uh, stable funding mm -hmm. and consistent funding. And uh, you know, higher ed does not have a Prop 98. The community colleges benefit to some extent as from Prop 98, but mm -hmm. certainly not four-year schools. So while we um, are interested and I think conversations through, you know, historically have arisen about what do we do, what is that dedicated source of funding um, for higher ed, what does it look like, is it, you know, viable, is it not, what other elements would you have us think about that's not funding related in terms of the legislature and direction to support the student from outreach to admissions to enrollment to graduation and beyond besides funding besides funding hmm, that's a good question i know it's a hard one it's a, it's a it's it is a hard one and it's one we grapple with mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. well i would i would say you know just more conversations like this i think are incredibly valuable for instance, the two to one ratio. Mm -hmm. I completely understand it. I'm a product, like I said, of the community college and it was a good start for me. Um, 
but it also, when we're trying to get very creative with our outreach efforts and we're trying to reach as many students as possible, sometimes being bound to such a restrictive policy with zero wiggle room, for instance, that two to one is, a, is an exact count mm -hmm. of the ratio we must maintain. Yep. And so sometimes, like, we were off by 10 students, and so we mm -hmm. are doing all these special efforts just to make sure we get those last 10 students enrolled. That's mm -hmm. taking up an enormous amount of time and resources. So I would also say sometimes a little bit more flexibility and understanding the challenges of the work that we're doing uh, would go a long way in allowing us to do really what we think is best for the students. Mm -hmm. and uh, I think one thing that I would add is, is just taking advantage of the programs that currently exist. So right now the California Student Aid Commission will reach out to Cal Grant recipients letting them know that they qualify for the CalFresh program. Couldn't we somehow have those, uh, you know, instead of having students have to, to apply for the CalFresh program, mm -hmm. just create a pipeline and automatically connect them with the resources that's that they qualify for. That's on my bill idea for. list for 2019. Yeah. Uh, awesome. We're already, we're already thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, can I just add one thing and uh, that goes back to Senator Jackson's question <laughs> um, about how we measure things. Um, the kinds of metrics that you all look for and think about when we indicate what success looks like I think building on Lisa's response, having conversations about what success looks like and what those metrics look like together can really help us all understand each other mm -hmm. and build programs that are more sustainable as well. You know, one of the things that uh, I think has been sort of Governor uh, Brown's whole approach is graduation. Mm -hmm. um, he wants graduation numbers. Doesn't necessarily demonstrate that someone actually has gotten a quality education. Mm -hmm. They graduated. Um, there's got to be a happy medium somewhere in between where we can judge the quality of that education as well as their graduation. And maybe that's a conversation we could have with you uh, because I still believe that the goal of education is to teach people how to think critically, mm -hmm. not necessarily just to get a job. Yeah. Um, uh, and perhaps the answer is, again, somewhere in the middle there. Mm -hmm. um, the notion you have to scramble to meet your two to one ratio, of course, is frustrating. Uh, on the other hand, what we see as a legislature is sometimes people really start fudging the numbers and taking advantage of some of that flexibility. So maybe that's somewhere too where we could find that happy medium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As far as the graduation, I don't want to diminish uh, what you said, but um, in not much at, so much at the UT, but really at CSU issue, but still at the UT, if the more students can graduate, it, it, and I want to go over to 3.9 years for, for your freshman in our agenda. Is yeah. that? 394? Yeah. Yeah. Still, that's yeah. pretty remarkable, and I think it's lower than um, the uh, mo most UTs. And, you know, now we have students who get the Pell Grant in the summer. That, that's just a win-win for everybody because that's less student debt that that student has. They graduate in a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. That's more access for other students to try to get in. So um, one thing that's kind of been frustrating for m many years is, is like Tony was saying earlier, that here in the summer, uh, Mr. Haynes was saying that it's just a great campus and, and we have these buildings and facilities here. So h how do we better utilize um, the facilities <coughs> That's been, that's been a topic that's been going on, yeah, on yeah. for decades, yeah. yeah. But, well, but I think it's changed. It's changing, and we actually have a number of very innovative yeah. summer so, programs. So tell me about that, how we're getting more students. Well, our office, of summer. our office of summer sessions um, is very entrepreneurial, actually, mm -hmm. and has worked in collaboration with many of our other offices, um, whatever continuing education is now called, which I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, they just changed their name. But they've got a number of really, really innovative programs that are joint programs um, in sort of academic slash professional programs. Um, journalism of public advocacy is one. And there are a number of them. So th there are programs like that that are going on in the summer. We also have a number of very innovative um, bridge programs for students. So we have a freshman summer start program that runs in our second, s uh, second major summer session. So the six weeks before the fall quarter starts. That's really, really booming, and it's an excellent transition program. So the data show that students who start in that program, mm -hmm. especially underrepresented students, 
really do remarkably well um, coming into fall quarter. I mean, all of our students what coming do remarkably well. I know that housing is a big crunch. I mean, you're housing going is for empty. So housing is the biggest. Care for free, right? They're, you're um, some campuses are doing stuff like that. Mm, uh, 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 Mike's office, yeah. Is also doing a lot of online courses yeah. for students yeah. who can't afford to stay in the summer. Yeah. They need to go home and work or, or have family yeah. connections. So that our summer is actually doing a lot more online. Yeah. yeah. And Mike's office has a new program to fo uh, support students who need to stay in campus housing during the summer. As right. Well. We, we've been trying to expand um, funding options for students to be able to you know, not only attend. So if they attend full time and they're, they're taking at, at least 12 units, we'll pay for 50 percent of their housing on campus. So is the, is the 3.94 because the students start as a freshman taking a bunch of AP courses that they already have a semester done? Or is it because they're taking more than 15 per semester? Or is it both? Or, or do Summer, yeah. Summer. Yeah. yeah. A combination it's of a all of those mm -hmm. things, yeah. A lot of it's AP, college level courses, summer courses, the freshman summer start. It's very, very common now to see a student who enters as a freshman actually have enough units to be sophomores and even juniors. We're seeing an increase in the number of high school students who've already completed their general education courses mm. through dual enrollment programs of students while still in high school. So yeah, we're. Oh, I get you with the freshmen. Students are looking for ways to shave off costs. Right. Graduating sure. early is one. Yeah, definitely. Well, I was thinking, you know, uh, to, to get that final credit, taking underwater basket weaving. I mean, that's you know, we don't want to. <laughs> it's not quite what we're trying to accomplish, yeah. but. No, and actually, I don't think that's what they're doing so much. My day, yeah. maybe so, but um, no, we're seeing students think very strategically. Students are very outcome focused. So mm -hmm. regardless of their major, for instance, they might be um, a science student who wants to add a minor in professional writing because they you know, think, well, I'm gonna need to know how to write grants, so I'm gonna add the minor in professional writing. Um, so students are very strategic about what they are staying longer for. Back, you know, Chuck say my day when you could stay a fifth year because fees were affordable. Now students are looking for ways to graduate early or if they're gonna stay the four full years and maybe a quarter more, it needs to be because they're supplementing their mm -hmm. resume mm -hmm. with uh, a study abroad, with uh, an experiential program that is sure. going to make them more marketable. And increasingly we're creating programs that build in that kind of mm -hmm. experience for students, even in the sort of more traditional quote unquote liberal arts education. In my day, students tried to stay in school for five years to avoid the draft. <laughs> I don't know if anybody remembers anyone here was of that era, but yeah. now students are trying to graduate earlier or at least to supplement their, their viability in the right. workforce. Yeah, yeah. very so strategic. Yeah. And on that topic, I actually want to follow up. Uh, the center and I just came from a hearing related to natural disaster response, and um, it's certainly a, a very important issue um, at the state level. And one of the things that has come up has been, what's the role of our research institutions um, in helping us address, I mean, something that's so big that all the experts are still struggling to figure out what we do about the wildfires. Mm -hmm. And as I hear these conversations about uh, students um, being outcome driven, I mean certainly I work here and the term scientific degree matter to us. I think about the Senator's comment related to we also want them to be critical thinkers. Um, in, in my case, uh, I have a special place for undergraduate research um, and research altogether. Right. And wanting students to, yes, get these degrees and get very practical uh, skills that will help them get a job, but certainly as we tackle monster issues, we need the critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. We need the researchers to help us tackle mm -hmm. problems that are bigger than us right now. Um, can you speak to some trends that you're seeing around mm -hmm. uh, students? I mean, are they still getting these experiences? Is that an area where we are doing a good job of investing, maybe not doing as great of a job of investing? Mm -hmm. Because that is so key for the state of California. Yes, we, we in, in fact, yes. So uh, we just are in the process of uh, reviewing undergraduate research and creative activities grants. So that's one of the major undergraduate research programs in the College of Letters and Science, and our application numbers were up hugely this year, like by 20 or 30 percent. 
Um, and so that's our, the program where students conduct independent research. We also have a program, a sort of gateway program, where students work with faculty who list research in their directories, also up 20 or 30 percent. So we know that undergraduates are keenly interested in that research experience, and we know how important that research experience is, as you know, mm -hmm. um, for really helping students develop, not just as critical thinkers, which is very important, but really their senses of selves as people who can make a contribution around really important issues. So. Yeah, undergraduate research has always been My role as associate vice chancellor of undergraduate education is sort of a new role in, in creating this office of undergraduate education. But uh, the, the two sort of key things that we're creating as capstones for students are the undergraduate research as an on-campus experience and then study abroad. So if you know you two are students, education abroad is always sort of a call for us in this space. But what we're making them be two capstones for this experience is what mm -hmm. we're hoping to happen. Yeah. And I think, you know, frequently admissions is just thought of as either recruitment, you know, passing out brochures, those kinds of things, but much of what we're doing is educating students about what's coming ahead for them. And a huge part, if you watch our campus video, if you look in our brochures, you will see undergraduate student research is heavily promoted. Probably the most common questions we get at those receptions I mentioned that the chancellor has led all these years is what are the, the opportunities to get involved in research? We are seeing a lot more students coming to the university from international baccalaureate programs, IB programs, where critical thinking is pushed dramatically and students start getting research experience in high school and they're looking for that experience when they get to the university. Mm -hmm. One of the things we talk to students who have a lot of those advanced placement units and IB units and college credits before they come is what that's gonna allow you to do is get involved in outreach, lighten your schedule a little bit to allow more time for those experience or programs for outreach, so, excuse me, for research. So we start talking about research the point that we are recruiting the students. You'll see information about the McNair Scholars programs in our email campaigns that we send to students. We try to use McNair Scholars, for instance, um, in our student profiles of success um, that we highlight in all of our informational brochures. And we also, I just will add, have programs that help students develop to become undergraduate researchers. McNair is a kind of capstone experience, but those early gateway programs are so important because they help students learn to do that. And faculty are very, very invested in those programs as mm -hmm. well. Thank you. Okay. 55%. 55%. Yes, fifty five percent of undergrad actually fifty six. Yeah. Percent of our undergraduates have a research experience. Thank you so much. We'll now proceed with our, our final panel. Last but not least, of course, is our faculty and student perspective. Um, hi there, my name is Madeline Loudon. I first want to thank you um, for coming here to our campus. It's a lot easier that you're here rather than us tracking you down. Uh, <laughs> yes. yes, but um, I'm a third year history of public policy major at UCSD, um, and I've had the opportunity to work. Your third year, and wh where are you from in time? Sorry. I'm from Irvine. Irvine, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, over my time here, I've had the unique opportunity to participate in a lot of organizing efforts on our campus. Uh, through the Office of the External Vice President for Statewide Affairs and through our lobby forward group, um, which has met with all of you um, in your offices. And I ended up doing a lot of work that I did not necessarily know I was going to do in high school. Um, entering college, I was excited about research and about lobbying and policy, um, but I didn't really understand the dire need for that type of work when I came here. Um, nobody had a conversation with me about what the UPs were actually like and so when I came here, the reality was very different from what I was told about what the UP could offer me. Um, I found myself organizing for students that don't have housing, they don't have food, um, trying to fight for some funding for sexual assault resources on our campus, um, issues that I didn't think were going to be this prevalent in a state-funded institution that I grew up hearing um, was one of the best in the world. And so that was first very startling for me. And then the longer that I went into it, another interesting thing that I learned was the disparities between the UP campuses. Um, that was a concept that never had occurred to me before, that there could be a campus like UP Merced 
um, that lacks so many basic resources um, compared to UC Berkeley, that has been here for a long time, but these students both deserve uh, you know, equal chances to have um, a chance at succeeding in their education, and the resources that are offered to them definitely plays a fact in it. So that was really startling when I first came here, um, was realizing that all the students protesting at Berkeley and on our campuses were actually trying to yell really loudly because people weren't hearing them, um, and that they've been in this situation for a long time, and that we've hit a breaking point where um, UC Office of the President has refused to listen to students, and now it's come to the state has refused to listen to the students for years, and it's being put back on the students to handle and help remediate these issues. Um, and that, I think, is a situation that is not fair to put you know, nearly out of high school <laughs> students in. Um, and it's something that I'm really passionate about. So something that I find unique about the 1916 California Higher Ed Master Plan, beyond um, the creation of a really unique higher public education system, is that how the authors and legislators and higher education leaders um, in a period of a lot of pressure due to unprecedented population growth still maintained the idea that higher education needs to be affordable. Um, and so I think that was a really unique idea for the time and I think that there's a lot of parallels to what we're experiencing now. And I understand that we have a huge population pressure on us now and that we're in very different circumstances. But I also understand that the situation we're in, especially with increased funding in our state, is a policy choice. Um, and it's a policy choice that students aren't really going to put up with anymore. And I think that's been very evident over the past couple of years. Um, and beyond that, too, the, the 1960 uh, California Higher Education Plan really only paved the way for a type of education for students that our state actually saw getting higher education at the time. That means we're still relying on a system that over-prioritizes white students to come to these schools. Um, a system that was heralded for its time and still today for the opportunities that it created, but that disproportionately created them for a very small portion of our state, um, and it's still being represented on every single one of our campuses. So um, this has been very interesting development in my understanding of how higher education works, not just at the UCs, but in California in general. Um, and seeing as this conversation is more focused on UCSD, there are some issues that I want to point out that Eddie and I have experienced over time here that I've worked with a lot of students about. Um, one of the issues that we have been made of aware of this year is the lack of funding for undocumented student resources on our campus. So as I'm sure you're aware, the UC Office of the President um, is not going to renew the funding sources that they're getting. And instead, they're handing that job down to the chancellors to fundraise. UCSD receives the least amount of money for our undocumented or student services, and we also have the lowest amount. And as I'm sure it is proportional, um, as I'm sure that's proportional, that's still not adequate. We should be enrolling a lot of undocumented students. We should be making sure that these students are not going to have to fight for resources from their chancellor for funding, but they should be like actually being taken care of by the state. The state needs to fight for all the students in our public system. So that includes undocumented students, that also includes non-resident students. Um, as I read in this, in this agenda, make up 16% um, of UCSD population. That's a huge portion, and these students are carrying a huge load um, on their shoulders to pay for this institution that we shouldn't necessarily have to pay for. And our tuition is making up such a large portion of, of the California, or of the UCSD um, funding, and a huge percentage of that is coming from non-resident students who are being punished solely because they're from a different state, but really, really respect the institution that they're going to. And that, as I know personally from a lot of my out-of-state students, are really dedicated to staying in California and getting a job here um, and working in these communities that we've all learned to love. So beyond that, there's issues such as mental health services. Our CAP here only has five counselors for sexual assault um, survivors. We also, they, uh, as I recently got information from, they had only planned to see 40 people per day. They're now currently seeing 70 people per day. Um, there are a lot of instances in the UCs when people have spoken to counselors and said this is a dire emergency and they have been told to wait two weeks. A mental health dire emergency is what it is. That is an emergency. Um, and we are at this institution and the situations that we're in because of a lack of funding are contributing to increasing mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And that's a truth that just needs to be spoken um, and it needs to be addressed. 
And a lot of students, I mean, Eddie and I had to come in between class. I'm missing class. Um, organizing is hard as a student, but just trying to live your every day is hard as a student um, in this institution, and that's just not a truth that we're told when we come. And a lot of kids come here, and they face really severe basic needs issues as well. Um, right now, I think like the overall amount of students are 44% are student teacher. Across the UC system, it depends on what campus, three to 15% are homeless. Um, honestly, these statistics are scary, and I'm living in this reality. Uh, and it's interesting having these conversations about how best to remediate the situation that we're put in um, with people that have the ability to change it. So um, I would just like to remind you all that, again, this is a policy choice. I understand that there are a lot of different factors playing into it. Um, there's a unique relationship between the UC and the state. Um, but as we saw last year through a lot of our students lobbying efforts and the, the funding that we got from the state, um, there's really, really an important need to look past that and address the real issue um, and really look at the students and look how we can benefit the state and also on a very humane level think about the situations that they're trying to live through just to receive an education. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon assembly members. Uh, thank you for having me here. My name is Ruben Benaka and I'm a fourth year political science major at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Now I'm also the founder and chair. Where are you from Eddie? I'm actually from Riverside. Riverside. Riverside and Thousand Oaks, so I kind of moved around a lot. Yeah. So I'm also the founder and chair of the Coalition for a Better UC, which is a student-run activist group here at, based in Santa Barbara's campus. Now, last year, the Coalition for a Better UC actually pushed for a bill to extend the Cal Grant Summit, AB 3152. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, our bill failed. But in the process, after consulting all of our delegates and all the people who were involved, we decided to bring it back again. And so we reached out to UCSA, University of California Student Association. We renewed our partnership with them and we've also reached out to the Cal State Student Association. Now in the process of going to all these different institutions, we realized that although our problems are nuanced, they're same, they stem from the same core. And that core is the fact that the California legislature systematically defunded higher education. According to the Public Policy Institute of California, for the past 30 years, in the past 30 years, we've seen a drop from general funding higher education spending from 18% to 12%. What that means is that per UC student, that's a $15,000 drop in 30 years. Per CSU student, that's an $11,000 drop. Now what hasn't dropped in the process is the need for college graduates. And according to the same Public Policy Institute of California, we're gonna have a college graduate deficit of 1.1 million by the year 2030. And that's one of the more conservative estimates. I believe Institute for College Access has that number around 2 million. Now in spite of this, California's higher education systems are still not graduating enough students on time. So now in this process, I also don't wanna trivialize what the UC is doing because we are very much aware that the UC is leading a lot of institutions in graduating students of color. And they should be commended and applauded for that. But even here at the UC, if we compare Pell Grant recipients to non-Pell Grant recipients, and I'm using Pell Grant as an indication of income status, we know that non-Pell Grant recipients are graduating at rates of 70% in four years, whereas first-generation black and brown Pell Grant recipients are graduating at rates below 15%. For black students, it's about 43%. For brown students, around 46%. And the reason why we bring up these four-year graduation rates is because these institutions are marketed to us as four-year institutions. So we're not gonna look at their six-year graduation rates. We're interested in the four-year because that's how it was sold to us when we applied here. Now in the CSU system, we know that the numbers are even more dismal. Mm -hmm. We know that the entire CSU, the Cal State University system population, their four-year graduation rates are around 25%, mm -hmm. which is pretty sad. Now that is why we from the College for a Better UC, as well as the Cal State Student Association, as well as the University of California Student Association, will continue to push for financial aid reform. We will push for a summer Cal grant because we know that research done by the Department of Education shows that when students take more summer courses, they're more likely to graduate on time and the University of California Office of the President also has research cooperating with us. We will push for expanding access to financial aid because we understand that there are currently people, low-income students, who still don't have access based on how the rules are set up for financial aid in California. We will also push for legislation that understands that it's not enough just to look at tuition and fees, but you need to look at the entire total cost of attendance because there are things such as housing and textbooks that are making higher education a fallen aid good based on income. Now with the new governor and legislator, what we're hoping is that y'all will stand with us for the sole reason that we are definitely going to come back, we're definitely going to bring these issues up, and we're prepared to fight up until the California legislator remembers that when you invest in students, you invest in the future of California, politically and economically. So my only question to y'all is, will y'all stand with us? I hope the answer to that is yes, and I'd like to thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Assembly McCarthy, uh, Assemblyman Dalimon, Senator Jackson, 
Um, my name is Tony Vaughan. I'm professor of economics and uh, chair of the European Santa Barbara Economic Forum. I, I'd like to thank you first for uh, coming to Santa Barbara and holding a hearing right here on, on our campus. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of the, the faculty. I've been at UCSD for more than 25 years now, and like many of my colleagues, uh, made long-term commitments to the campus, the university, and, and the state of California. To start, I'd, I'd just chime in with the students and, and note that I think faculty across the UC system are seriously concerned about the budget and, and, and the budget planning. I mean, we're, we're committed to the public mission of the university to do research and to train the next generation of, of Californians. And um, we're proud to be probably the best public university system in, in the world based on the um, you know, master plan and, and the uh, buildup of the, uh, the system. And we have high standards on what we think what it takes to give students a first grade education and who want to give students a first grade edu education. And given that, we're, we're greatly disappointed by the, the downward trend in, in state funding, mm -hmm. um, you know, on app in, in relative and per capita relative to the state's budget and whatever uh, measure you want to take. You know, looking back over the 25 years that I've been here, um, we've gotten whacked uh, in every recession, severe, gotten severe budget cuts. And in every downturn, we have failed to get comparable budget names to reinstate the cuts that were uh, the names before. And frankly, I am a little bit afraid that we are keeping up with the trend as we express the concerns about a possible recession coming forward. We still have not recovered from 2008 cuts despite a couple of years of uh, you know, moderate uh, funding increases. But let me focus on Santa Barbara. and. Um, say two things about our campus, uh, comment on the, the presentations made earlier, and then uh, bring up a couple points on, on my own. A uh, couple, few things about Santa Barbara. Um, we're a liberal arts campus, and, and proud of it. Um, we're focused on giving students a top quality education in, in a broad range of disciplines, in the humanities, in the sciences, in the engineering. Uh, we don't really have a lot of professional skills. The only one we have is focused on the environment, and that's, I think, very telling as, as the focus uh, of research across a lot of the disciplines. But that makes us more dependent on state support than many other campuses, and so we're always hoping that our efforts are appreciated in, in Sacramento, and we're hoping for your uh, support there. Um, we also feel like we're a relatively new campus, and uh, we're growing, we're getting better. So despite um, you know, all the obstacles, uh, our trajectory is, is up, and we're uh, basically optimistic about our capabilities uh, if we get uh, you know, decent funding. On the research side, our reputation is steadily rising. The chancellor explained uh, some of that. Our uh, research funding is now almost equal to our entire state funding, and that's, that's uh, you know, pretty significant. On the teaching side, we're becoming both more diverse and more selective. I mean, diversity and inclusion are, are obviously core values. Selectivity is a bit more of a mixed blessing, but it's a signal that, that our um, teaching is appreciated, that um, you know, they're, they're using the eye for, for what we're doing. Uh, we're also doing our own fundraising, but unfortunately that's difficult in, in the core areas of you know, funding for classrooms, teaching labs, uh, maintenance, other core support. That's, that's a challenge for which we need uh, great support. Uh, now, third and perhaps most important for the purpose of this uh, hearing, we have pretty good relations between the faculty and the university administration. And UC, in, in general, is known for the principle of shared governance, which allows faculty to work through the academic senate to participate in um, university decision making. And I'm pleased to say that in UC Santa Barbara, shared governance is, is working really well. And I, I credit our chancellor for making a point of um, consulting faculty and other campus groups uh, on, on important issues that are setting the right tone. And as you know, the chancellor has made a long-term commitment that many of the faculty to this uh, campus, to this conference, is filing. And uh, shared governance uh, sort of leads me on to, to comment on the presentation slide by the chancellors uh, and, and others. Most of what they said is really not news to, to me. The concerns have been fairly broadly discussed, and uh, the faculty tends to agree uh, pretty broadly with that. And I'd like to make that and be that understood as an as a, you know, endorsement of the, the issues we've heard. The uh, you know, struggling with the rise in, uh, of enrollment without um, 
It's a very funny you go hire faculty without sufficient funding for classroom space. We're troubled by the enormous support maintenance and, and we're certainly uh, strongly supportive of uh, capital projects and I, I was delighted by your comments, um, General Percy, about the potential bond issue. That would help us uh, greatly, I think, to get it built in, in, uh, in a few years. Now, let me raise two things that are, that are part of the you know, faculty concern and the graduate student faculty renewal and, and, and quality control. A graduate student, especially PhD students, are really central to the research industry. And we are really troubled by the slipping share of graduate students at UC Santa Barbara. When we formulated our long-range academic plan about 15 years ago, the uh, graduate student share was 13%. The centerpiece of that plan was to raise that share to 17% to do a better job uh, in, in that area. Instead, the share has declined to 11%. And, and that's really disturbing. It hurts our ability to teach undergraduates because the PhD students serve as TAs. It uh, hurts our ability to create research because the PhD students are also uh, research assistants. And it hurts our ability to attract faculty who would like to work in an environment uh, that's rich mm -hmm. in, in stimulation from um, smart uh, PhD students. And research and teaching are really inseparable at, at UC Santa Barbara as it, as it should be. Um, because teaching advanced topics is simply impossible unless the instructors are in the <coughs> leading edge of research in their uh, respective fields, and the, the PhD students are really at the, the center of that. Second point I want to make is on, the, on faculty renewal. Many of our faculty are in their, in their 50s and 60s, and uh, many of us love our jobs so much that we st uh, stay way longer than is financially attractive, but eventually people retire. And uh, that's a problem because the university has really taken a systematic advantage of uh, faculty member loyalty. It's well known that long serving faculty um, often accept below market salaries without immediately threatening to move. And um, they could prefer to choose to build and fall into disrepair without immediately getting, getting upset. But um, when we're trying to hire new faculty, that's a problem because we can't get them to come unless we pay competitive salaries, creating inequities, driving morale problems. And uh, we need to fix up the space for them to come and feel comfortable in, in the space. So um, you know, speaking as an economist, paying below market salaries and deferring maintenance is a great short-term strategy for, for saving money, but it's really not a sustainable solution. And we're concerned about faculty renewal needing more attention going forward. My last point is about quality control and, and specifically the, the principle of, of peer review. Uh, this is worth emphasizing given this you know, growth in reporting requirements that we've experienced over many years. And I have to say I have no problem with an accountability provided those who ask us for data also you know, pay for the staff to provide all those data that would be a source of growth in, in, in staffing. But the point we'll make is that as far as I can tell, the quantitative metrics really don't get to the heart of how the university works. The key principle here is peer review. When you produce research, it's not recognized until it's validated by independent reviewers. And um, we apply the same principle to teaching and to the organization of the university for shared governance. You know, every course has course evaluation. Each faculty member is reviewed every, at least every five years, typically now 15 and uh, two or three. Uh, every department is regularly reviewed by outside experts that examine the quality of instruction, quality of research, quality of the curriculum. And those reviews look at metrics, but I think an excessive emphasis on metrics runs the risk of um, losing, uh, you know, missing the big picture, the, the non-measurable aspects of quality. And so the, the great strength of peer review is that it combines measurement with good judgment. And the me message that I'm trying to uh, send here is that I'm asking to have some trust in the faculty. Um, we're concerned about overly numerical guidelines, benchmarks, rigid rules like the two to one ratio for freshman transfers that were, uh, were mentioned. And we believe we deliver our trust, uh, we, we sort of deserve some trust because we have a fairly deeply ingrained culture of peer review and shared governance and that provides a much more rigorous quality control than anybody could in, impose from the, from the outside. So in summary, our ambition is to make UC Santa Barbara a, a campus that produces world-class research and provides outstanding teaching to a diverse student body and 
I believe we've been quite successful despite all the challenges and, and ask for your support. Uh, we really need a s stable and reasonable funding level and, and a measure of trust that we'll use such funding appropriately and do well. Thank you, and I will turn it to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just have a few uh, questions and comments. Uh, back um, in the day, uh, the state of California, I think, put in 58 cents of every dollar the university spent. We're now down to, is it 17 or 18 cents? So we really have lost that commitment. The University of California used to be free. Um, that was the commitment that anyone who could qualify would get a free education because they do bring, uh, th your comments are absolutely accurate. Most of the students who go to the University of California want to stay here in California, and most of our UCSB grads want to stay here. I mean, they're smart. Who, I just came from Chicago in a snowstorm. Who wants to live through that? Life's too short. So um, part of it is that we've lost uh, that, that sense. But that being said, we are trying to identify our, our media students and provide as much funding as possible. And I do know, I don't know the exact numbers here at U UCSB, the number of students who get Pell Grants and Cal Grants, and God only knows what all there is, but when you work with students and, and help them, most, uh, most of the students who need it don't pay tuition, but they do have to pay for living expenses. So I'm not sure where the university can come in, and, and I'm, I'm trying to respond to your, I think, very eloquent and, and accurate concerns about edu getting education here. How, how, do we, how do we do that on 18 cents of the dollar? Uh, versus 58 cents to the dollar, which we used to do, I think it was back in the 60s. Um, so, uh, I, you know, funding. I mean, there's a movement right now, frankly, that I disapprove of uh, intensely in privatizing all of education. We're seeing that the University of Michigan comes to mind. I think that school's basically been privatized. Uh, I think it's a foolhardy effort and a bad one, but we've done a little bit of that here in in California. So I, I think one of the questions that I had um, in this whole discussion, and by the way, I do want to agree with you, mental health services are completely inadequate. I put money in our budget as the member of that uh, subcommittee, I think it was a, a $25 million, which would have put money in for each of the UCs to start dealing with some of the mental health issues we're seeing with our students, and the governor took it out. Well, we have a new governor coming in. He said higher education is a priority of his, and I'm hoping this will be one of those uh, priorities. Um, I do agree. If we can graduate students, give them Cal grants in the summer, that was one of the things I was told. There, the cost of a, of a unit is higher in the summer. No funding available. Well, who in the heck is going to take advantage of it? But th th you made a statement that we're over-prioritizing white students. So I'd like you to clarify that a little bit for me, particularly in light of the statements that we heard here, how we're doing outreach, how we're getting a, a pretty significant number of underserved uh, students, 40% are the first in their family to graduate. I know we're making efforts, but could you explain to me what you, what you mean by over-prioritizing white students? Yeah, uh, the first thing I'd like to say is it's pretty evident in the data when you look at the demographics of each campus. Even here on UCSB, 31% um, I think is white um, of our students, and that is just not representative of what California is. Um, and I think it's as simple as that. Well, okay, what percentage of California I I is white? I have no idea. I but think <laughs> it, well, uh, the reason I ask is that I think we are, we are certainly a minority majority state minority, I'll put that in quotes, so that the state is comprised more of uh, communities of color. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that 31 percent is an over um, reflection of the white population, which is why I asked that. Um, I, I think one of the things we can talk about when we talk about prioritizing uh, let's look at black students specifically because I for I'll just throw my foot in the DOT basket. And one of the things which we saw is for the longest time our statistics were the black student population was around one would hover between two percent, three percent, even though we know that in the entire nation. Yeah, ninety, I think. Yeah, thirty percent might be up there. And so we knew that the pretty much 
And then for in the state of California, it's, I think it's all types of black people. But even for the black kids who weren't here, what we did is we actually did a survey of those black kids, and what we found is that a lot of them didn't connect with police. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there was a huge push to say, I know that uh, the mission is out there as we're working on this. There's a huge push to say, well, a lot of nonprofits want to send their black kids here, don't want to send their black kids here, because if the black kids who are there are saying, I don't feel mm -hmm. accepted on this campus, then what's the point of sending black kids there? So I think there has been somewhat of a push to create more programs to incorporate black kids, but then if we're looking at those surveys of what actual black kids were saying here, some of those things are very visible. They're like, I don't feel like I've been on my campus. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that happen on my campus don't, they make me feel like an outsider. There's a lot of stories about that. And so there's efforts to like try and put, um, I know there's efforts to try and, last, I know in missions right now, there's a to create a mentorship program, which takes students who are black kids here, who've been here for a while, and mentors them. And because part of that reason is, that's when that program was created by black students, actually, because we saw that a lot of people, they come here, they don't have that connection to the community. Right. And so this is, it is a bit of a problem. It is actually quite a major problem because this is a predominantly white institution. And for some of these students, it's like their first time just being put in here. And so having no sense of community, having no sense of connection to people who look like you, that becomes an entire problem. And if you're a first generation, you haven't been asked to do certain things. Right. I can even talk, I think Mike actually mentioned the Promise Law program. Promise Law program actually took a lot of black students two years ago. Uh, I had the privilege to actually work with them over summer. And one of the things which we noticed about the Promise Law program is that the reason why they started becoming successful is they were being given these resources early, early intervention. Mm -hmm. Because if we're talking first generation students, mm -hmm. there is a difference between first generation students and students who probably have parents who've been there. They know the system, they know they can ask their parents questions like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas first generation students, it's like you're being thrown here, you haven't been here. And so I think we, for a long time, there was a blind spot in universities of not realizing that these, there's a certain institutional knowledge that by not being from that family, you're prevented from going to college that you're lacking. And, and, and I don't disagree with you. I yeah. In fact, I think you're absolutely correct, and that's been my understanding, wi particularly with African-American students yeah. on campus. But the statement that we're over-prioritizing white students, mm -hmm. I, I'd like some clarity on what that means, because I'm, I'm, I'm not getting what the concept is. Mm -hmm. And I agree that we have not been, and one of the things we're trying to do is wrap around services for first generation students, yeah. um, it, you know, whose families don't have a history of that, they're not able to lend the kind of support that's necessary. I get that, but yeah. how are we over prioritizing the white student? Mm -hmm. Well, in saying that, it's not necessarily something that's so overt, um, as I think it used to be in higher education systems, whether it's through admissions and stuff, and there's been a lot of effort to remediate it, but it's, it's evident through um, a lack of funding for even down to resources. Um, for things that a lot of students from white families or like white students um, have economically like better situations than students of color on our campus and the state and the university's inability to acknowledge how that has a significant impact on their ability to succeed here um, I think is evident that we are not providing resources enough for students that we are trying to create opportunities for them to come okay. and so there are efforts um, to encourage the um, more students of color come to our campus and that they're close to graduation. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that it is a disservice to students of color that we're not acting as fast as we should, um, that we're not diverting enough resources to these programs. Um, and it's beyond recruitment and retention. It's down to basic needs programs. Mm -hmm. It's down to the mental health programs. It's down to um, recruiting more students of color for our graduate school. Um, stuff like that. So while it's not, and maybe that cover, that statement I said can perceive, be perceived as a little blatant, um, I, I do think that it is a situation that is that dire. Our public higher education system should be a system in which we can help alleviate the disparities between people of color and white people in the state of California. Um, and I just think that it can be better and I want it to be better yeah. than it already is. And I think part of it starts before college. I mean, to it definitely so, yeah. so, so I appreciate that because I'm, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm not sure I would characterize it as over-prioritizing the white students, but I do think that we are not taking uh, into consideration what the, the challenges and the needs are for students who are first generation or students of color who haven't had the same opportunities uh, because of family circumstances or just the, the general challenges associated with getting a quality education. We don't see it as much in the ghetto communities as we do perhaps in some of our upper middle class white communities. I, I get that, I agree with that. It's, it's just to, s to say we're over prioritizing white students I think is, it moves me sort of uh, in a focus that I'm not sure I understand. Thank you. And I think it's important too, let me um, interject
subject, but I appreciate that kind of back and forth, is if you look at higher ed in general, uh, it's, it's a good point earlier, kind of Jack, as far as how much California needs to invest in higher ed. That's when the California edu higher ed system you've seen in CSU was very, very impressive. We're now in an era as an HSCSA in the CSU particular kid report last year talking about this issue. We're now when the UC and CSU combined is 76%, communities of color is an era where higher education funding is down mm -hmm. here in the toilet. And so the, the overall deal as the, as the university system is getting more brown, the state commitment to higher ed is going down. Not trying to use the line there, but um, <laughs> that, that I think that is the, uh, is the picture that, that we have to always realize is that in California, higher education funding has backed it up a lot. But, but back to, uh, I appreciated you lending the first student perspective. And um, I, I do think it is important. Some of the things that we're grappling with is, is um, if we had two suitcases here of let's say a billion dollars, <laughs> right? So for UC and CSU, you could take that and properly fund. And I know UC and CSU are asking for 500 million piece this year in their budget, and I think they should ask if they need. But you could, you could boost up the UC system, pay for compensation, pay for deferred maintenance in case of needy uh, re-enrollment. But that has not one penny more for the reality that you're talking about for the students. Debt load, housing, mm -hmm. hunger, food insecurity, works and so you could have the other two billion dollar suitcase and uh, re reinvest it in financial aid which is what which we've been trying to do in the summer the last couple of years basically uh, expand the Cal grant give you an add-on Cal grant to not just be tuition but help pay for your cost of living your dark gentrification housing and so forth and you know that's that's our job that's what the budget section people do is grapple with these scarce resources and compete with healthcare and early education and childcare and preschool and after school programs and the works and um, and uh, you know that's our job. Yeah. Your job is to advocate for higher education and getting the funds to have it done. But um, I we hundred percent understand and, and I appreciate you uh, lending that perspective and um, you know we're going to get back at it in 2019 and I think there's there's an opportunity. We have a, a, a new governor as, as was mentioned who's championing heavily uh, higher education. We have a little bit of new uh, re increased revenue in, in the 2018-2019 budget. Um, there is plenty of conversations about um, ballot measures and increasing funding for education from you know early education through K-12 through higher ed because we're not you know funding what we need as far as the outcome. You know, we just we may not have you know we're we're just underachieving. So I just want to thank you for, for sharing your, your, your perspective. As far as the, the faculty, I just have one, I appreciate your perspective as well. Just one comment, it's, it's a big interest of, of the legislature as far as the faculty and diversity. I know you, you mentioned that we do teach a very diverse student population, and not diverse enough, many of us would say, but we're much more than we were. And um, there is an opportunity with retiring faculty. You know, the, the UC is retiring, and, and as we, as we replenish these um, these positions, it's really important that we we work hard to try to have people that reflect the students. You know, I think it's not only right, but you know, we should pay the students to be better in our classes and our workplace. So I just wanted to mention that. So that's a, a top priority. Uh, I know our Definitely. budget chairman, Mr. King, this is one of his top prior priorities, and we've been working on this for the last few years now. So thank you. That is the definitely the priority for us. The, the big issue for us there is one, the, the size of the pipeline of um, uh, graduate students, PhD students who are ready to take faculty positions and the tremendous competition with, with other institutions. Um, and so the pipeline, I'm getting that for graduate students. If we um, you know, fund uh, graduate students, PhD students, mm -hmm. that, that has traditionally been CSU systems and other universities uh, around the state, UC has, has been the pipeline. So the more you know, diverse students and graduate students we get, the more we build the pipeline. And then the faculty positions, it's really tough. 
Um, my own department in economics here um, actually benefited from the um, mistake funding for faculty diversity that uh, was uh, provided to us a year ago. Mm -hmm. we, we competed for that for the first year. We didn't get it, and uh, the, the campus actually provided funds on their own resources to support us a little bit. And my student got, uh, got funding. Uh, that that uh, helped us. We also have um, uh, you know endowed chair and also a chair who uh, one of those mm -hmm. for for fundraising. Uh, now our experience has been we have shrunk down. We have looked at all the sort of intellect here, all the assets we have from uh, you know faculty and economics all about the top seventy or eighty business decisions around the country. You know looked at every single person and said the student got this and was miserable what it will take to make this person. Um, we did that three years ago, scanned the entire market, uh, you know, made, made an offer, and actually made two offers, but all we did was raise their salary and took their home and didn't do anything, because mm -hmm. if you're making an offer, they're mm -hmm. coming back with a counteroffer. That's the reality. Um, last year, we were, we were more successful. Um, we, um, got for the state funding, we got uh, one um, Hispanic scholar, young economic person, um, who got uh, first a, a postdoc for a year, his expenses uh, for the Pembroke block uh, was with the state funding, and then uh, he's, he's uh, on board as a faculty member. Uh, we also hired a uh, female faculty member uh, so that uh, the, the best support thing went all out. And then in the process, uh, it turned out that we, when we, when we scanned the, the uh, market for the Knoll Hall here again, we found somebody who uh, was a year out, uh, has a checkbook, and, and used uh, part of the state support <coughs> for that. Uh, to do some research funds, to do some seed funding for the center, and that's the kind of support that it takes to hire a minority faculty here at the park. It's an extre extremely competitive market. Yeah, we had a three-hour hearing on this <laughs> three weeks ago. So uh, we, we 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 know it's it's uh, it's you know time to think what we put in it and make it a priority. And we have we we are we are committed to doing that. We look forward to it every year. We are. Great, thank you. I appreciate the perspectives and I appreciate the advocacy. Certainly, I started as a student activist at the UC and my college friends don't understand how I ended up working for the UC for 11 years. Um, and uh, so I appreciate the role and I think as uh, Chair McCarty said, uh, that is your role to be advocates and to be uh, vocal about uh, you know, the issues and um, imperfections we see in the system. There was a comment made around a decrease, if not a defunding, in support to undocumented students, and I'm hoping that someone could please clarify what that means. Um, and I don't, is there a program that went away? Was that from co coming from UC Office of the President? Mm -hmm. I can provide, and I think. We, we can ask the, the, new, the UC Office of the President as a representative here. Maybe they can enlighten us. Thank you, Chair McCarty. Saya Verzman, University of California Office of the President. Um, we currently have funding for undocumented student programs for 18-19 that, that was set as a three-year funding that ends in 18-19 that has not yet been extended because it's funded out of the UCOP budget. The regents usually approve the 19-20 uh, OP budget around May of um, 2019. So this coming spring, would be when the regents approve the um, potential extensions, but we haven't unfunded anything. It's just we haven't yet actively approved the next cycle of funding. Okay. And that's done by the regents? That is done by the regents. Is there any indication that that's gonna be a problem going forward? The regents are highly supportive of undocumented student okay. services. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for thank flagging you. it for yeah. us. And so thank on you. the record, we support that. <laughs> and I know the regents, uh, at our urging, ha have looked to look at other pots of money UC-wide to prioritize statewide priorities, and, and this is one that we've, we've uh, we, uh, talked about. So, thank you for your thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for the, for the presentation. I believe we, we yeah. now uh, have the opportunity if anybody, I know you've been here three hours now, but if anybody uh, would like to speak um, this is our public comment section, so if there is anybody, please uh, line up right here. I'm reading a prepared statement. Great, so go ahead. Hi everybody, my name is Jonathan Wood. For those who don't know me, 
I serve as the Vice President on the Board of Trustees for Santa Barbara City College, but I'm here representing the Reclaim California Higher Education Coalition, which is a coalition of unions, faculty groups, and student groups across all three segments of higher education. I just want to give a shout out to the students and their marvelous comments. I think you know, I was a student leader, and they get better every year. So uh, this, the GPAs are rising, but the advocacy is, I think, rising even more. Uh, so first, I want to say thank you for hosting. I think it's very interesting to do a deep dive on a campus specific instead of on the system wide, because you know each campus is different. Um, I want to thank you all for what you've done to fund higher education in the state of California. I think you know you three specifically have been very strong advocates, and you know I think we all believe that a higher education is the single best social mobilizer available to us as a society to move people up. Six years ago, the state fully funded the university, and there was no tuition, with only incidental fees. Today, individual students and families are being given the responsibility of funding the university, rather than the public at large. At UCSD, we're seeing it's at a two to one ratio. The system-wide core funds are about almost 50-50 coming from uh, the state or from tuition. On top of that, they are paying more while receiving less per student funding than compared to the year 2000 or the year 1985, while seats are you know, being allocated to, to out-of-state students to help make up for those budget shortfalls. Further, this overall reduction in state support happened gradually as campuses did become less white and more diverse, and as our prison populations grew and funding was diverted in that direction. The result has been an unprecedented student debt crisis. Because even if you get a Cal grant to pay for your entire tuition, which I did, did not pay tuition for four years, I still ended up with $20,000 in debt because you need to pay for the cost of living still. And uh, it's difficult to even measure how many people uh, self-selected out of the system because they were debt averse or that they were shocked by the sticker price, as was mentioned. Um, even if you, know, you come from a low income background, I did, a lot of my friends didn't end up going because it cost too much, it wasn't for them. It's often said that it's way too expensive to return to tuition-free college, or to restore quality and per student funding, or to expand access and fully fund each new student into the university, or to provide robust financial aid for cost of living expenses. To do them all would seem you know, impossible. We are here to say that it'll actually cost $15 billion if you include the $6 billion required for Prop 98 you know, for all new revenue, uh, which translates to 50% of taxpayers paying a tax of $66 a year or less uh, to, fund this, to fund this budget. At that rate, 90% of people will in fact save money sending their kids to college without tuition and instead paying you know, small tax over the course of their lifetime. Again, this number factors in both eliminating tuition, uh, restoring per student funding, repurposing financial aid to cover cost of living expenses, and to expand seats available. We are also looking at metrics to correspond with a, such a large increase in public funding, but all could be done for a relatively affordable price to the individual in a tax form of financing instead of a tuition form of financing, which you know, we, we feel that tuition is in fact a tax on those who choose to go to college. This would realign the university back into becoming a true public good rather than an individual endeavor. This would end the student debt, debt crisis, allowing graduates, graduates uh, all of them, not just the rich ones, to start their lives after college without debt. Because right now, most of us graduate with debt. Uh, and then we would be able to spend our money in the local economy instead of sending it to Pennsylvania, which is where my $300 a month goes. Uh, we have went up and down the state the past two years as a coalition, raising awareness, building support, and taking feedback on our idea and plan and we have found resounding support from organizations of all kinds. We look for, uh, our coalition goal is to finalize a bill or placeholder in the first week of January for introduction in the next session that encompasses the tenants I've described. We look forward to working with this committee, the Senate, and other partners in the coming months to reclaim the promise of the master plan set in 1960, written in one year on a typewriter uh, for the 21st century now moving forward. Uh, we want to end by saying that in the last session, the legislature and the governor you know, accumulated the votes and passed a gas tax like that to address a dire need, that I, I do support that, and we do support that. Are we prepared to do the same for the dire need in higher education right now? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing nobody else.
that uh, concludes our hearing this afternoon. Thanks again to the participants and thank you to the uh, UC Santa Barbara Greater Family for hosting us today. Thank you.